Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear God, please bless our elected officials. Grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mrs. Riska. Can we please have the roll call? Mayor Taylor? Here. Mrs. Taraski? Here. Mrs. Koski? Present. Mr. Radke? Present. Mrs. Schmidt? Present. Mr. Yanez? Here. Mrs. Zarko? Present. Thank you, Council. We need approval of the agenda. Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Koski? Move to approve the agenda and move item 11A to 7B under public hearing. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion with no? Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Koski? Uh, if you would like, we can have the city attorney explain why I made that move. Mr. Kashubsky. Uh, simply put, uh, the item was noticed properly in the newspaper as well as certificates uh, of mailing to the residents uh, for a public hearing. But for some reason, it was put on the agenda as a consideration item. We've just simply moved it to the proper place for the night. Okay. Um, I'm satisfied with that, Council. Any further discussion? With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. Let me begin with a housekeeping item. Uh, the city offices will be closed for business on Friday, April 19th, Good Friday. There'll be no delay in refuse collection services and will be reopened for business on Monday, the 22nd. And also, we've had some inquiries about uh, street sweeping. Our street sweepers are back out. Obviously, we can't sweep the roads during the winter months, uh, but we do uh, typically start in mid to late April and then throughout the uh, season up to about uh, uh, November, December, depending on weather then. Uh, so as all of you know, the leaves fell very late last year. Uh, so unfortunately, there's a lot of leaves in the gutter line. We're trying to get around the city as quickly as possible, but it takes us a few months to get through one revolution. And you could imagine the first revolution is pretty slow because it's very heavy, the material that we're picking up. So um, if you can, if you notice an inlet in front of your house that is covered in leaves, uh, we do request that you try to rake that off. Uh, just so during the rainy season we can get good drainage on the streets. Uh, but rest assured, the street sweepers will be around and we're on a normal rotation. I also wanted to share some exciting news uh, with the uh, audience members. Some of you may have read this in the newspaper, but we have another new hotel coming to Sterling Heights. In addition to the uh, few that we'll be talking about a little later on in the agenda, uh, but the new hotel that I'm highlighting this evening is a Hilton Home to Suites Hotel, an extended stay that will be located near the southwest corner of Dobry and Mound Road. Uh, the hotel will be uh, just to the west of the Texas Roadhouse and to the north of the AMC Theater on some vacant property. It's a 107-room hotel encompassing approximately 61,000 gross square feet. Uh, so it's a pretty significant development, as you can see. Uh, certainly very aesthetically pleasing, meeting all of the uh, city's requirements with respect to uh, masonry. I'm not sure why that came up. I hate those. <laughs> that is slightly annoying. Let me see if I can get rid of it. Okay, so uh, you can see ample landscaping. There'll be some decorative lighting. Uh, lots of masonry on the building, too, so the city has newer requirements for uh, extensive masonry on new construction. So you can look forward to this starting soon and being completed uh, in the next year. And again, it's indicative of the uh, robust commercial development that we're seeing across the city. Uh, we have multiple hotels, uh, not to mention many other commercial developments underway across the city and along our major corridors. So uh, it's really nice uh, to see this. And again, we'll be talking about some other hotels uh, a little later on. And switching gears, uh, many of you may have participated 
in the city's uh, hazardous waste event this past weekend. It, it went very well, is very successful. In fact, uh, actually it was two weekends ago, this last weekend was our uh, electronic uh, collection. So in any case, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the successes from uh, this program, if I can draw your attention to the screen once again. Uh, first, um, during the hazardous household event, almost a thousand vehicles went through our public works facility to drop off hazardous household goods. And in fact, we had over 43 tons of hazardous material uh, that, that was discarded that, that were paint alone. Uh, so the largest portion of it uh, was paint. Uh, so 43 tons uh, in total, half of which was paint. And we had four tons of discarded herbicides and pesticides that were discarded. That individual, you know, half used bottles or just uh, slightly left. I mean, that, that's a lot of tonnage and a lot of material that we're thankful we can get rid of and that wasn't pouring that poured down the drain or storm sewer or something of the like. Of course, that's not permitted. We had a ton of old, one ton of old antifreeze that was collected, sitting around in garages and sheds and so on. So nice to get rid of that. And believe it or not, I found this interesting. We had two 55-gallon drums of expired medicines uh, that were collected in the hazardous uh, drop-off. Uh, uh, so you can see some of the, the cars are wrapped around. If you were in the line, I apologize. I know they were long. Uh, but you can see just an unbelievable amount of material collected. This has proven to be incredibly successful. It's for residents only, that's the good news. And on the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see just the unbelievable amount of uh, paint cans that were collected. Uh, so uh, we look forward to continuing this event next year. Uh, you can start uh, looking forward to saving your stuff and making sure you can get rid of it next year. Um, so I also wanted to highlight that we have cleanup Saturdays continuing on April 27th, May 4th, and May 11th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. So you can take items like furniture, lumber, tires, dirt, tree stumps, etc., and dispose them in dumpsters at the DPW facility. These are items that you can't normally set out for curbside refuse collection. So we encourage you to continue the cleanup efforts of your properties, and again, that's April 27th, May 4th, and May 11th at our DPW facility. And then on May 4th, uh, once again, we have our Pride and Shine cleanup day. We'll be cleaning up 25 to 30 homes of individuals that just aren't able to do so on their own, raking leaves, trimming bushes, painting, and the like. Uh, but we need more volunteers. So if you're willing to volunteer, we'd love to have you. That's on May 4th, 9.30 a.m. We meet at the First Church uh, of Sterling Heights, which is on Dequinder Road. Uh, it's very well organized. You only have to put in a couple hours of work. It's a fantastic event. Uh, please call 446 City if you'd like to volunteer. These efforts are helping to keep Sterling Heights neighborhoods looking good and property values high. You may recall from earlier uh, reports and previous meetings, uh, Sterling Heights ranks among the highest in property values statewide. So we wanna continue that and it's all about helping uh, have our properties look good as well. In addition to helping preserve property values and neighborhoods, the city is doing all that is possible to stimulate economic development and fostering a climate where businesses can flourish, expand, and add jobs. The hotels we're talking about is just one small example. These efforts have paid off with massive business investments in commercial and manufacturing <clears throat> corridors throughout the city. The Macomb Oakland University Incubator, located in the Velocity Collaboration Center right here in Sterling Heights, helps to ensure this cycle of prosperity continues by nurturing and the development of startup companies. Periodically, we highlight companies that are proving successful, <clears throat> excuse me, and have a promising future for commercialization and expansion of their product. So I'm very pleased this evening to be able to highlight Microside and by introducing Dr. John Lopez, who is excited to share information about his interesting company and the state-of-the-art product that he's gonna 
uh, show us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Van der Paul and members of the City Council. I'm honored to be here to present to you some background of our company, which is located at this campus-like environment. We call it incubator at the Velocity Center. The environment is very conducive to research and development, and uh, we can make many new strides in the development of products. Uh, here's, uh, slide one shows you a glimpse of the products we have developed at the center. And uh, we started the company uh, some time back, and uh, I'm the president of the company. And uh, our mission was to eliminate toxic and harmful products like chlorine and other pesticides from the personal environment as well as a community center so that we can have clean water and clean environment, clean food, and good health for the people. Uh, as you can see on the second slide, uh, we did not inv uh, invented food safety. Food safety was inherent in human culture. And when the first uh, man, caveman, uh, heated or uh, burned his meat on the fire, he started with a food safety. Actually, he started food safety for taste, but incidentally, unwittingly, he introduced food safety in the food products. As the science progressed, we went on further, and uh, we introduced glorious pesticides like chlorine and chlorine dioxide, ozone, hydrogen peroxide, and all that. And we uh, thought that these are the marvelous products which will kill bacteria. <coughs> Only thing is, they kill bacteria all right, but they also produce toxic chemicals along when they uh, interacted with organic chemicals and they produce carcinogens. So along the way, we lost the taste of the food products, <coughs> but we introduced a bad sanitizing or safety <coughs> issues in the community. So we started having a very green technology and uh, green products to eliminate allergic reactions and uh, carcinogens and pollution with the uh, plastic bottles. So uh, we introduced chemicals which are food grade and uh, the uh, products we introduced were based on, it was a sort of an oxymoron to use food to kill bacteria in food. So no, not using the pesticides. So in the process, uh, we were recognized by the community and also, as you can see in the second slide, next slide, and next slide, again, we were uh, honored by the EPA. They recommended us for the Presidential Green Chemistry Award because of the introduction of the technology. Our technology uh, produces antibacterial compounds or products to eliminate from agriculture, uh, personal products, healthcare, as well as consumer products. So uh, these products are very stable, and they are modulated in a way that when you introduce in the uh, sanitize your foods and food products or surface sanitizers, they clean the products, they kill the bacteria all right, but when you introduce or left over in the environment, these products are modulated. And the, in the environment, they are completely chewed and biodegraded so that they do not leave any toxic footprints. So in the process, we have a lot of uh, different capabilities of the products. And as you can see here, that we can have uh, products 
in the terms of uh, ready to use products and these are environmentally fresh non toxic you do not smell anything and also we in to avoid the plastic accumulation in the environment we introduce powder concentrate you just put it in water tap water and make a sanitizer like this so you don't have to have lysol bottles or chlorine bottles and then throw them away and collect all lot of garbage so in doing so uh, we have products for agriculture nasa has introduced our products for going to mars because of the safety of astronauts and a uh, lot of other companies like uh, starbucks are using our products because of their environmental uh, consciousness as well as adm and uh, us navy has introduced a product for us submarines because they do not want any toxic products in the submarine environment this is a closed environment and uh, they do not want to have a uh, lot of pollution where the uh, crew cannot be intoxicated i'm sorry <coughs> so in short our products and technology is safe for people safe for environment and good for the nation thank you mm, thank you And just by way of review, the McComb OU Incubator is a partnership with the city, City of Sterling Heights, McComb County, State of Michigan, and Oakland University. So Oakland University actually serves as a general manager, if you will, of the incubator and works with the businesses and helps uh, uh, them develop. So it's a great uh, asset that we have right here in our city and it's really neat to see businesses like this starting up and flourishing and the whole idea is that businesses will eventually move on from the incubator and and into larger spaces hopefully in Sterling Heights uh, but certainly within the area we benefit either way as a community and so mayor that concludes my report this evening all right thank you very much uh, mr. Vanderpool a uh, very informative there um, Next item on our agenda tonight is the uh, Nice Neighbor Award. We haven't done one of these in a while, but we've got a pretty special one to do tonight. So uh, I will hand it over to our Mayor Pro Tem, Liz Zorowski. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, tonight we are honoring uh, a group of mostly ladies, I believe. I don't think there are any gentlemen in their group who donate their time and their talents to many charities, churches, hospitals, and specialty groups such as the American Heart Association. This group is called Sit and Stitch. And they are ladies that meet, uh, meet together. They do needle craft work, so it's, I believe it's crocheting and knitting for the most part. And they knit booties, caps, and hats for babies in the hospitals. They make specialty hats, little small red caps for American Heart Association to, to make bring awareness to the redness always brings awareness to heart health. So these ladies spend so much of their time together, I know, but still their time and talents to help other people that don't have that talent. And it's a, it's a lost art. We don't want it to go up too much farther because we do need to, it's a wonderful ability. Your, your abilities are wonderful. So I wanna thank you all. My understanding is that these ladies have donated, created 1,500 caps, blankets, and booties that they've donated to the hospitals. And 80% of this, their costs are covered by donations and gifts, but 20% come out of their pockets. And these are people generally on a fixed income, still donating and giving back. That's, that's like the, the last copper penny of the poor lady in church. That is something where you think that comes from something different than their wealth. That comes from their, it takes a lot out of it. So we want to th say thank you to the ladies as well. And there are any of the gentlemen that support them and help them. So we don't want to leave the gentlemen out. So I would like to have all of you who are in this group come up to the front and we will get, present you with your awards.
That's who they thought about. Wonderful service. <coughs> Before we conclude, I wanted to mention one of the ladies told me this was started by a lady who was 85 years old and lost a dear friend and wanted to do something, get together with some friends um, on a Wednesday night. Three of them started it and they have blossomed into a quite, a, quite a large, very, very active ladies group. So thank you again, ladies, for all that you've done. Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we do have a suggested action to present them, but I think you've done a good job I'm doing so that. There's yeah, no, I jumped right I don't in. think there's a motion, though. Um, no. So you've taken care of it perfectly, and we want to thank the uh, ladies who are, are doing what they can to make Sterling Heights a better place to live and work and play and um, congratulate them for all their efforts. So thank you. So mm -hmm. that will move on to our next presentation tonight, which is a swearing in ceremony for new Sterling Heights police officers. We have a presentation from our police chief, Chief Dale Dwojakowski. <coughs> chief. Hey, thank you, Mayor Taylor, members of council, Mr. Vanderpool. Feels like I was just here bragging about finally being at full staffing and that was November, the first time we we're at full staffing in almost five years. So since then, we've lost three people. Actually, one was a retirement, an unexpected retirement. Uh, one was a new position that this council so generously funded, the Phantom Drug Unit with Macomb County, and you guys allowed me to backfill that position, so that is a brand new police officer to the Sterling Heights Police Department. Thank you very much for letting me backfill that position. And the third position that we're filling tonight was uh, one of our last candidates did not make our training program. Uh, before I stated that our field training officer program is very vigorous and we are a professional police department here in Sterling Heights. These guys go through 16 weeks of training and if it's not working out, we part ways. Um, we want the best to be here for 25 years. These guys know it. That's why they're here today. And we have three unbelievable candidates. Again, these are the top of the brand new list that we just got certified. Um, we have three outstanding candidates. 
And again, the reason they come to Sterling Heights is reputation. We're a professional police department, period. They know that from the UP down to the lower part of Michigan. Um, Sterling Heights is the real deal. We are a large organization that has a fully staffed traffic bureau, narcotics division, surveillance division. We have our drone unit now, canines. We have everything. Um, pay and benefits are excellent. I know these guys look at that as well. And also financial stability. Uh, all three of these guys just made comment before the swearing in tonight. Uh, they're all coming from another department. <laughs> they're leaving a department to come here to Sterling Heights and they need to spend 25 years. They wanna make sure that they have a job for 25 years. Uh, there's a lot of cities out there that are on shaky financial grounds and Sterling Heights is not one of them. And that is a big reason that they're here because they need a job and they wanna work for the best department and they wanna work fin a financially solvent city and Sterling Heights is just that. So on so many of those boxes, when police officers look for jobs, Sterling Heights checks the box in every single category. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Anthony Jantz to the far left there. Anthony is married, he's got two children. Uh, he's been a police officer since 2014. He comes to us from the Wyandotte Police Department. Graduated with an associate's degree in criminal justice from Macomb Community College. While in Wyandotte, he was a traffic officer, he was on the Honor Guard unit, and Anthony was just selected as Officer of the Year for the Wyandotte Police Department. <laughs> I know they're not happy. <laughs> So again, we just literally took their best guy and took him. So this, uh, that's why we're not very well liked by some of the other agencies. Uh, so we're very happy to have Anthony here. Um, and Jason Burge in the middle there. Uh, Jason is married with one young son. He's been a police officer since 2016. He is a senior airman with the Air National Guard. Doesn't look old enough. Um, and Officer Burge comes to us from the Port Huron Police Department. He has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Ferris State University, an excellent program there. And Jason comes highly recommended. We heard great things about you, Jason. So we expect those things to continue here in Sterling Heights. Um, and then Brendan Harrison, the tall guy on the right. Uh, Brendan is married, um, no children. He comes to us from Ypsilanti. Um, he's been a police officer since 2012. Graduated from Madonna University with an associate's degree in criminal justice. He started their honor guard unit there at Ypsilanti and he was a canine officer in Ypsilanti. Mm. So all of these guys, tremendous amount of experience and they weren't good officers, they were great officers where they came from and now we have them. So we're very, very excited. So with that guys, we'll do our swearing in oath. Raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Brendan Harrison. Harrison. Do solemnly swear. Discharge the duties of police officer, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties as police officer in and for the city of Sterling Heights, in and for the city of Sterling Heights, and that I will strive to maintain the highest standards of that department, and that I will strive to maintain the highest standards of that department to the best of my knowledge and ability, to the best of my knowledge and ability. Congratulations. Uh, with that, I'll have Anthony come up and say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here, especially my family and friends, uh, especially my wife. Special thanks to her. If it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't be standing up here right now. And uh, I'm very happy and thrilled to be working in the city that I grew up in and uh, provide the service to the citizens. Thank you guys very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, also, I want to give a special thanks to the Council of War, the Department Chief, my family and friends for coming out tonight in the community. I'm very happy to get the job here with Sterling Heights. I'm looking forward to moving forward with my career. I see a bright future here. Uh, just thank you, everyone, for the opportunity, and I'm excited to get started. So. Good evening, Council. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you uh, for the opportunity to serve your community. I want to thank my family and my wife for sticking by me. Uh, it's, it's, the city's wonderful. It literally checks every box. And the one box that the chief didn't talk about is, is family. Uh, and this department is definitely a family. It, it took eight hours for me to realize that. And I, uh, I, this is going to be a bright future for my family. And I, again, I appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Uh, with that, again, this is uh, our, we now have exactly 58 new officers, as in they've been hired in the last four years, and 59 old officers that are older than four years. So we're exactly 50-50 with our new hires versus the guys wow. that have been here for a while. So we are a new split department, couldn't be any happier. And with that, if council would like to come down and say hello, we'd appreciate that. All right, Chief, anything else? Okay, I'll open it up to our council if there's anyone that's, uh, that would like to make any comments. Anything? Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Sorowski. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys for being here. My son is an MP in the Marines, so I know a little bit of your job, and it is uh, amazing, the bravery, the courage, the dedication that it takes, and that you are obviously have in your hearts to uh, take care of us. So I thank you, and welcome aboard. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank you all for coming to Sterling Heights. I know that uh, you left careers elsewhere to come to our city and uh, improve it. You all seem to have very good resumes. And I just want to thank uh, the, my colleagues on council and the chief for creating a new position in Sterling Heights. We're adding a police officer for the first time in a long time, and that means we're going to keep our community even safer. So thank you so much, gentlemen, and good luck in your careers here. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Anyone else? If not, uh, just welcome aboard to the three of you. Thank you for coming back home, and thank you for choosing to make Sterling Heights your home to you and to your families. We welcome you to our community, and, and thank you for being a part of our community. If you haven't quite settled uh, on where you're going to live, we think you'd find Sterling Heights to be a pretty great place to live, too. Between uh, the top-notch police department, as you already know, and our fire department and all our parks and, and resources here, I think we've got a great community. So like I said, to your family members, to your kids, um, we welcome you here. We thank you. I think you'll find that we've got a wonderful community of almost 135,000 residents who uh, really do uh, take pride in our city and in our police force. And, um, you know, for a long time, we've, I've been here almost 10 years. Some of my colleagues have been here much longer than me. We've always said we've got a, a great police department, and we always have had a great police department. But from what the chief is saying, you know, we're a split department with half of the officers new and half of the officers, I wouldn't even say old, that, you know, being on, on, on for just four years or more. Um, what it means is that we hope that those officers have instilled in the younger officers, or I should say the newer officers, that sense of community that we have here and what it means to be a Sterling Heights officer. And I think we, we really have. We've, shown, we've seen with every new round of new hires, the reputation is continuing uh, to only get better. So. Um, you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a lot of, I wouldn't say pressure, but uh, you've got a, you've got a lot to live up to and we're confident that you can do it. So thank you again for joining our police force. One more big round of applause for these three new hires. <laughs> thank you very much. Stay safe out there and uh, God bless. So chief, if you want to dismiss them and their families, they can head out, take some pictures and celebrate a little bit. Thank you again very much. So, the next item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing. This is a public hearing to consider the application by the City of Sterling Heights to establish a commercial rehabilitation district at 7491, 7575, 7605, 7681, 7739, and 7755 17 Mile Road. We have a presentation from our Senior Economic Development Advisor, Luke Bonner. Mr. Bonner. <laughs> we got Mar Luke, Martin's, back there. Martin's, Martin's back oh, there. Martin's back there. He's, he's sucking up already. <laughs> <laughs> he's well, a good politician. Well, I've seen him. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mr. Manna, you'll have your turn. <laughs> 
All right, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, members of Council. Uh, tonight before you for your consideration is the establishment of the Commercial Rehabilitation District uh, created under Public Act 210 of 2005. It's actually one of the few incentives that we have at our disposal to help facilitate the rehab redevelopment of commercial <coughs> property. It acts very similarly to the industrial facility ex exemption certificate process that we're more commonly used to. Um, the property's location um, is essentially about a seven acre parcel on the north side of 17 Mile Road between Van Dyke and Mitchell Drive. So it's right in front of Sterling Enterprise Park. Uh, in terms of the qualifiers uh, under the act, um, it has to at least be 15 years uh, preceding use as commercial or industrial property. And that commercial or industrial property has to be um, blighted or obsolete. So given the history of those properties over time, um, it does qualify um, under the act. Uh, we are um, requesting the designation of this district this evening uh, in preparation for an eventual application um, by HHC Hospitality, uh, who has a, a previously approved PUD by City Council for a multi um, hotel development at that location. Um, to talk a little bit more about that actual development project, I wanted to invite up uh, Mr. Terry Riddle, who's the president and CEO of HHC Hospitality. He can give an overview of the project and a little bit of a timeline of what we can expect to happen uh, moving forward this spring and this year. Terry? First, I want to apologize. I, did, I was coming to just sit in the audience. I didn't figure out I was going to be speaking, so I would have put shoes on a little differently <laughs> than a tennis shoe. I apologize. Uh, uh, Terry Riddle, President and CEO of HHC Hospitality, hotel uh, developer and, uh, and manage our own portfolio. We have a portfolio of 17 current, uh, five under construction currently, uh, in uh, predominantly Indiana, Ohio, <coughs> Illinois a little, and Michigan, uh, a few, but uh, a lot more to come in Michigan. Uh, this particular development will be two Marriott product, as, as most of you are aware, as we've been before you before. Uh, to a Spring Hill Suites, uh, as well as a Fairfield Inn uh, in Suites by Marriott, and a Hyatt House, which is an extended stay model uh, with the uh, Hyatt brand that will be there. Uh, we've, as, as you've drove around, we've gotten a lot cleared out. Uh, we've had a little pause because it took us a little time to get some disconnects uh, happening on the last parcel that was purchased, uh, which was uh, finished about a week and a half ago. I think we got finally got consumers or one of them was uh, was finally out there so I'll uh, be demoing that pulling the demo on that next week uh, and then our our hope is to complete some stuff with planning and start construction on uh, the two Marriott products within the next 30 45 days is is my hope I mean we're prepared we just got to work through some uh, some final things with planning on that and then uh, be open in sometime 2020 and we'll do the best we can to kind of get it get it up and running pretty quickly. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes my comments and presentation, Council, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Bonner, Mr. Riddle. At this point, I'd like to open up the public hearing and ask if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to speak under the public hearing. If not, I will close the public hearing, and Council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolved to adopt the resolution approving the application by the City of Sterling Heights to establish a commercial rehabilitation district at 7491, 7575, 7605, 7681, 7739, and 7755 17 Mile Road. Support. Been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Schmidt? Just a few comments. Um, I, I think it's awesome that um, we've we were given the opportunity or the tools in the toolbox, so to speak, to redevelop this property. Um, it has been um, a blighted um, parcel and and um, structures on there for quite some time. So I'm excited to see something new and fresh come in. Um, just through the chair, to, maybe Mr. Bonner, you can answer this or Mr. Riddle. Um, <clears throat> so the plan is the two Marriotts first and then phase in that third hotel or do you have a time frame for that or is it just as warranted? Um, without getting too complicated in terms of the, the franchise agreements that uh, Mr. Riddle has, the, the, P, the PUD allows for 
three hotels to be construction mm -hmm. constructed on the property. Okay. The first two hotels, uh, from a franchise perspective, are secure, and those are the two that um, planning and engineering are working on today. Um, with the um, opportunity to add a third hotel, at which brand is still sort of to be determined. Okay. So I have nothing further. I'm just excited to see see you come into the community, and I appreciate you taking on that project. Mrs. Zarko. Um, I have to agree that I, I'm great to see this project taking place in that area. It's disappointing when somebody that's working in Sterling Heights says, tells us that they have to stay in Southfield and get a hotel room there because they can't get um, a, ho a hotel room on Van Dyke, that this certainly is a need. And as more um, industry develops, we know that these suites will be, they'll be um, filled to capacity, I'm sure. So thank you so much for choosing Sterling Heights. We appreciate it, and we're here for you. So nothing further. Council, anyone else? Mrs. Sorowski. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I also want to thank you for uh, choosing that, especially that piece of property that is uh, my right by my house, right by my drive every single day. And it's I've watched the development from even these poor guys trying to pull up stumps, which was not the easiest task. They were struggling with their bobcats. So uh, it's it's wonderful to see. It will be definitely, it is definitely needed. My family in particular can't hardly ever find a hotel room close. So that's often um, an issue. And as uh, the rest of the council has said, welcome. We look forward to seeing what you can do. Yep. Anyone else? If not, I would echo that. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to this project, another great redevelopment of, of property in Sterling Heights. Thank you, Mr. Bonner, for your work on this and for the presentations tonight. So without any further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda tonight is, uh, it was originally item 11A, it is now 7B, and this is a public hearing to consider a first amendment to the amended and restated conditional rezoning agreement for property situated on the north side of 15 Mile Road west of Ryan Road in section 30, case number PZ18-0002, Chaldean Community Foundation. We have a presentation from our city planner, Chris McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, before you tonight is that uh, potential consideration for the First Amendment to the amended and restating conditional rezoning agreement for the Chaldean Community Foundation, uh, which is relevant to the expansion of their current facility just north and west of 15 and Ryan intersection. Um, so maybe just a quick summation in terms of what was done originally as part of the first uh, portion of this process in terms of the original conditional rezoning agreement. Uh, there was an approval to expand their building basically to double the size of it, uh, to add about 15,000, uh, almost 16,000 square feet of additional uh, square footage to the building. Uh, that's off just to the west side of the current development, add additional parking spaces, um, and provide a lot more of the good services that are currently provided by the Chaldean Foundation. Uh, as the applicant has continued to work their way through that original approval uh, through planning and engineering, um, the, the question came up as to whether or not the district boundary wall could be amended out of that pot potential application. Uh, since there already is uh, existing screening in terms of, in form of a fence as well as some additional landscaping along the north and west property lines which are pertinent to this site and I'll show you the site plan in one second. Um, so basically to sum the request up in terms of this amendment, uh, they want to utilize the existing six foot tall privacy fence uh, that's along that north and west property lines. Uh, to the west of the site is Davidoff Drive uh, which is part of <coughs> the Hatherley development, which surrounds this development. So it's actually a roadway that's the abutting uh, western property line. And then there's duplexes to the north, and there's a separation of about 80 feet uh, between uh, building to building uh, along the back of the property line. The applicants are still proposing an evergreen landscaping along that west and north property line, uh, which is going to be between four to eight feet in height in terms of its planting height. Uh, which is consistent with the plantings that are on the current site. So if you're familiar with that site, uh, there is a line of arborvitaes that kind of surround the site. Uh, those arborvitaes will be continued around the expanded site uh, when the site is fully developed. Uh, the proposed building height at the rear um, of the addition is about 22 feet in height, just to give you some context. So this shows the existing site, um, and the, the overall orange area is the total site. Uh, the existing site, obviously, to the right-hand side of that box in area. Uh, and then the expansion would go into the uh, recently clear, cleared area. You can see David off street to the, uh, to the west side and then the duplexes to the top of the screen or to the north. 
So this was the original plan that was approved uh, as part of the conditional rezoning agreement. Uh, you can see the in the blue is the existing building uh, to the west side or to the left-hand side of the screen is the orange, yellowy area. Uh, that was the proposed addition that was approved. Um, and then showing the landscaping scheme and the parking scheme. Uh, again, that was originally approved. This was the actual floor plan layouts. Um, there was a gymnasium that was added uh, as part of the, the new floor area as well as a lot of diff, uh, additional uh, office space, again, to provide the services that are already currently being provided, more of them, as well as additional services beyond in that, which already were in the scope of, of the Chaldean Foundation. This shows the elevations. Um, basically, the new addition, for the most part from Street View, would mirror the, the current um, site itself, and then the gray area in the middle would be the new main entrance to the Chaldean Foundation site itself. And then in the background, in terms of the, uh, the, the second elevation down, you can see a darker area to the left-hand portion of the screen. That's that gymnasium that sits on the back side of the building. Again, not overly intrusive in terms of height, but then as you move down to the second to the bottom elevation, uh, you can see the profile of that gymnasium um, on the west elevation itself. So again, in terms of the proposed modification, uh, the orange dotted area around the, the top of the screen as well as to the left-hand side of the screen is that area where they want to would like to uh, have approval to remove the wall and again leave the existing privacy fence, uh, which is a wood shadow box type fence, and then plant the landscaping as shown on this plan. Doesn't show particularly well, but would be arborvitae planted four to five feet on center all the way around that particular area. Uh, so this kind of shows you some of the context of, of what we're looking at here. These are the duplexes on the north side. Um, the darker object, you can see the fence to the right, and the picture to the top of the screen. Uh, that darker area is actually the fence, sorry, the shadow, and that, and that uh, they, when the picture was taken was a little too intense, but shows the relationship of where those duplexes sit relative to the fence itself. The arborvitae plantings would be on the inside of the Chaldean Foundation portion of the development. And then looking back kind of from David off street, um, looking at the, the duplexes there um, and then the, the, the contest of, of where that sits. And then moving down, this is the actual west hand or, or the western portion of the site. Again, this existing fence would remain under their proposal. Um, and then the landscaping that's currently in place for the duplexes would obviously remain that wouldn't be touched but then there'd be arborvitaes on the other side of this fence that eventually would grow 8 to 10 to 15 feet tall um, as arborvitaes do ultimately providing a very thorough screen so all in all the proposed amendment doesn't change the method and <coughs> the amount of screening necessarily uh, because the wall would have been the masonry wall would be six feet in height um, and would simply take this fence out, replace the fence that's six foot tall now with a six foot high masonry wall. Um, so that portion is essentially the same other than the fact that one's masonry, one's wood. And then the landscaping remains the same um, that was originally proposed versus uh, what is uh, under the current amendment. Um, so with that, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions that council may. All right, thank you very much, Mr. McLeod. This time I'd like to, uh, the petitioner is here, the applicant, you want to make any comments, Mr. Mana, or just wait for, for questions if we have any? Okay. Uh, at this time, then, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on the public hearing? Yes, ma'am. Thank you to the council. I'm Vivian Ramsey. I live at 3572 David Off Drive. My uh, house uh, butts the fence area of the Chaldean Community Center, and I propose that we have the wall. It is a different in sound with the wall up there and with the fence. Of course, when you first drive into the complex, it's part wall, then you go into the fencing. That's because we had the the, the house that was there, the barn and stuff, and it kept the noise down. Now we will have more traffic, more noise. And there is, if you live there, you know the difference between a wall and a fence and noise level. And I prefer to have the wall. Okay. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir, come on up. My name is Dave, David Claxton, and I'm at 3608 David Off. 
uh, butted right up against the, uh, the, the wall that's presently there. And uh, as my neighbor just said, I really think we should maintain the wall and also the uh, wooden fences there. So I'm proposing that uh, uh, the wall be, uh, be put. Now, as part of the wall now, about, I would say about a third of the distance, and I'm, once they get the building finished, they will go all the way down uh, behind our buildings. So I would certainly want to see the wall there. All right, thank you very much, sir. Anyone else on this item? If not, I will close the public hearing and council, we need a motion. Anyone? Anyone going once? I will. Um, Mr. Kashubsky? Or Mr. Taylor? Yes. Through the chair to Mr. Kashubsky. Um, if I make a motion in order to, for us to have this discussion, can I vote against the motion? You can ultimately vote against it, but you can't talk against the motion because you're the one that made the motion. Okay. <clears throat> Could we table this then? Um, Mr. Kashubsky, if I step down as a chair, how, how would I make a motion here? <laughs> Mr. Mrs. Koski. I'll make a motion. Okay. Mrs. Koski. Move to reject the First Amendment to amended and restated conditional rezoning amendment for property situated on the north side of 15 Mile Road, <coughs> west of Rhine Road in section 30 case number PZ18-0002 and authorize, do not authorize signature. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Support. Okay, it's been moved and supported. Uh, any discussion, Mrs. Koski? Uh, yes, through the chair to um, whoever would like to answer this, Mr. McLeod, uh, are you prepared? Can you tell me why they uh, changed their mind and they want to eliminate the fence? The wall. Or I should say the wall. And where is the dumpster located? And I thought I saw a, a drawing that there would be parking um, directly adjacent to the condos in the back. And I thought this was a gated community. When Mr. I say McLeod, gated community, I'm talking about the, the condos. Yes. Mr. McLeod. Um, so yes, it is a gated community. There is a gate to get into the development that surrounds this uh, that surrounds the, the Chaldean Foundation. Um, the dumpster is currently located in this northwest corner, or proposed to be located in this northwest corner. Um, so that dumpster would sit probably about 15 feet off the north property line. Um, so it's between the, the dumpster itself, there would be uh, that 15 foot separation between the existing fence and the dumpster itself, and then there would be arborvitaes <clears throat> planted at a height of eight feet. Um, in that general location. Um, so you wouldn't see the dumpster uh, enclosure itself. Dumpster enclosures are maxed out at six feet in height. So it'd be screened not only by the, by the fence, but also by the, the higher uh, arborvitae plantings in this location. Um, the parking separation, yes. If we can go back to, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, we are there. Um, so there is parking that extends down uh, to that general area. So. As you can see here, parking is generally in that area, again, about 15 feet off of the north property line. So there is a separation there. Um, I will say this is an office district, which this is currently zoned. Uh, but again, it was done under a conditional rezoning. In our typical office districts, we do allow parking to go right up to the property line, um, albeit with a wall installed. So, you know, there's some, some similarities there, some differences. Obviously, we have a little further separation uh, here in terms of green belt and the additional plantings. 
kind of a double row, if you will, of arborvitaes and deciduous trees that go along that property, north property line. So um, again, in terms of the physical separation, it is the difference, basically what we're talking about is the difference between a, a six foot high wood barrier and a, and a six foot high masonry barrier. That's what this, basically the, the amendment sums up to. Uh, can you tell us why they changed their mind and refused to or do not want to put up the wall? I apologize, I, I did bypass that one. Um, so in terms of two different reasons that I know of and Mr. Manick can obviously expand on this. One was the fact that they felt that the existing fence in its current state was perfectly fine in terms of its physical presence uh, and the fact that if they installed a wall, it would likely bring that fence down uh, because both of them are on the property line, so to speak, and they can't share the same space. So that was reason number one. Number two was the fact that with that being said, um, the project is they're looking to do some value engineering in terms of that. Uh, and they felt with the amount of landscaping that they were doing and the fact that the existing fence was there, that that was one area that they could request an amendment to in front of this body. Who would maintain the fence? <coughs> um, right now, that is currently the development's fence. So they and how, how would you maintain a wood fence if you have a row of arborvitaes? I'm assuming that a wood fence needs to be painted or stained or uh, repaired in some way. So if you put uh, a green barrier there, how are you going to get back there to maintain that fence? <clears throat> so in terms of, of maintenance, I would, I would envision once the trees got to a size where they were basically growing together and knitting together, um, at that point, maintenance would have to occur from the residential development side. Um, and at that point where you simply couldn't maintain it on the south side or, or the east side, depending on which side of the development you're on, um, you wouldn't necessarily need to paint it anymore. I mean, because obviously the arborvitae at that point is taken over. There's no need to necessarily paint or, or stain it um, because it's simply covered up. But again, maintenance itself, in terms of if boards need to be replaced or sections of the fence ultimately needed to be replaced, be replaced that would occur from either the north side or the west side of the fence itself so mrs koski if i could the the applicant uh, appears ready to answer the questions regarding maintenance and uh, reasoning if you'd like to direct them to him just a suggestion well, i'm i'm done okay mr manna do you want to answer those those questions <clears throat> You mayor uh, members of council so it, can we go back one uh, a couple of slides so <coughs> you see the the existing fence from my understanding is continuous and I don't believe that that's um, so that was there when we had purchased the property I'm assuming that is uh, from the condo association am I correct uh, yes that's our understanding is that it's you know based on in terms of its continuity uh, an overall development that that fence would be the kind of condo associations yes okay and so we you know just to address this we're a not-for-profit organization um, our expansion came in uh, much higher than we had anticipated and the cost of a, a masonry wall um, along this this uh, corridor specifically this street uh, by the way which which is is kind of long is about hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and so uh, we're trying to do what we can. I mean, the main reason for the expansion is to help those with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And so we're trying to see, uh, like Chris had mentioned, to do some value engineering and save some dollars. Okay. I'm done. All right, Council, anyone else? Any comments? Mayor Taylor? Uh, Mrs. Zarko. Okay. Um, let me begin by saying I am grateful for your investment in our community. I have no problem with that. I look forward to what you're going to be able to do at this facility because I know what you're already doing for many of the residents here in Sterling Heights. So that's the first thing. Um, but if this is a financial burden, and that's, you know, because first of all, I don't know how long the fence has been there, but I know that I don't know how much longer it would be in the shape that it is right now. I mean, that, that would be one thing. 
But if this is a financial burden, I think I would be willing to say that we could give you some kind of extension or timeline that this could be completed over a period of time when you had the money. So that, I mean, because I know that you have a lot going on in Sterling Heights. We know that we, you want to uh, take care of what your plans are for um, the north end of Van Dyke. Certainly looking forward to that. But if it's, I, I have to also consider the residents that live there. And really the street part doesn't bother me where you don't have, where it's just a roadway. That part doesn't bother me as much as um, where this facility is going to abut the people that live behind it. Um, and right now that we can say, cause it's empty, it's really not bothering anybody. But once there's activity there and there's cars there, um, I think it would even be beneficial for you as well. But if if we could give you some kind of timeline in order to <clears throat> extend the purchase or the actual, you know, um, structure, I could go along with that before I could go along with just going with the wood fence. So, but like I said, I'm grateful for all that you do. Um, it ha that has nothing to do with it. It's just that I don't want to set a precedence for maybe another um, development that's going to come before us for with the same reasons. So, uh, nothing further. All right, Council. Anyone else, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Radke. Uh, to the chair, to Mr. McLeod, uh, the petitioner has to offer things to us here. We can't ask him to do things, or how does this, this work? Right. Per, per, Mr. McLeod. That's correct. Under a conditional rezoning by state statute, uh, any conditions that are proposed have to be offered by the applicant. Okay. Uh, so I guess I agree with my colleague, Mrs. Zarco. Uh, I think that the, the most pressing concern to me is the property that is directly to the backyards of these these duplexes right here. I think the, the best solution, if I was to do this, would be to build the wall to the corner, hook it, and stop there. And I'd be fine with what you're proposing for the rest of David, uh, rest of that Davidoff Drive there. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure that those homeowners there, uh, that they have privacy, and especially with the dumpster there and dump trucks coming through and everything, I want to make sure that they don't have the, the sound coming into their homes. That, that's what I, my suggestion would be. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Radke. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, I have to agree as well. Um, first of all, through the chair to Mr. McLeod, your your comment to Mrs. Koski about um, once the arborvitaes are big enough, the fence won't need to be maintained. I, I struggle with that because once that fence gets wet and the arborvitaes are in the way, mm -hmm. that fence is going to deteriorate even worse. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, I'm not an expert, but uh, that's what my gut tells me. Um, when this expansion came before us, we um, noise was a concern for the residents in those condominiums. It's still a concern of ours. Um, I am not um, worried about the, the drive in being a wall, but um, for sure what abuts those backyards. And as far as the dumpster goes, um, the east side of the property line abuts a shopping center. Why couldn't we put the dumpster adjacent to the shopping center where it's not going to be in someone's backyard and, you know, have 7 a.m. trash pickups? It's just a suggestion on placement for that dumpster solution as well. So as it stands, um, I support Mrs. Koski's motion, but I would not object to Mrs. Ziarko in just ex giving them a little bit more time to get that wall behind those properties. So I have nothing further. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Schmidt. Anyone else? Mr. Yanis. Yeah, I, I think my colleagues already said everything that I, I want to say, especially in regards to the dumpster. I wouldn't want to have a dumpster, you know, 15 feet off my property line, especially since nothing's been there since since they built the the, uh, uh, the complex. Mr. Mann, I, I, I'd just like to ask, what are the uh, hours of operation for this facility? Will you be having events on Saturdays and Sundays in the evenings? No. No. And before you guys asked, there's no banquet facility there either. I was, <laughs> I was not going to ask. <laughs> Although that's a pretty nice jump right but, there. You but I, I, there. I think just regarding uh, the trash, there was challenges with the truck going all the way. I mean, our current uh, trash bin is, is located adjacent to the shopping center, but for the 
truck to back up all that way didn't make sense. So we, we talked to engineering about that, and that was a change we made based on the fact that it would be difficult for the uh, truck to back all the way back out of the property like that. Um, I do have some su a support letter, um, and I understand. I mean, one of the, the things we had discussed is if it's not the entire wall, could it be at least um, along the west end? Uh, but I do believe, you know, I have one letter of support. I could get others of the people that are directly behind the foundation uh, that would support the existing wall that, that exists, which is the, the wood fence. And so, um, you know, we are uh, in challenge with time. We really want to get construction started. Um, and I understand that uh, there's a process here. So um, I don't know if we, if, you know, what, what steps we could take if, if you guys will consider us having a, a further discussion on this and giving us a temporary permit on the rest of the property so we could start some earthwork mm -hmm. until we figure this out or if um, um, you know we could have another discussion with planning and I could present all the letters that we have in support of us keeping the existing barrier as well. Okay, M Mr. Kashubsky, if we um, if we were to instead of denying this and rejecting the proposal. Instead, we were to postpone it to a meeting in the future, maybe the next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, to Would that allow the Chaldean Community Foundation to come back with a new proposal that the council might find acceptable? Um, <clears throat> and I guess, so is that an option? Yes, that's absolutely an option. Okay, and if, if that were to be something the council would consider, Mr. Manning, to, to maybe May 7th is our next meeting or May 21st, uh, would that uh, give you enough time to come back potentially with a, a new proposal that we could consider? Yes. Okay. To speak, yeah. um, okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak, Mrs. Uh, Sarowski? Yeah, I, I was going to probably just jump in anyway. So I do... Um, Mr. Manna, it, as Mrs. Ziarko said, I know personally some of the wonderful work that the Community Foundation does, and we really do appreciate everything. But we also have to consider would we want that um, without the fence and without the wall in our backyard? I wouldn't. And that fence, I know that it's existing there, but you're not even proposing right now to maintain it for the residents or to put up a new one if the you know the wind blows too hard as it does in Sterling Heights. That thing could come down. It looks pretty shaky. So I do think that I do support an additional time frame for you because that's I, I think just the wall at the very back would be a great idea. Those truck drivers for the garbage trucks are pretty adept at their driving. Maybe we could move that dumpster a little further away from the property line. That would be it's right by other restaurants and things that it would be a little more appropriate. So I, I support with uh, the, with uh, Mayor Taylor's suggestion that we revisit this in a couple weeks. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we get everybody so far? Mm -hmm. Motion on the floor. There's a so, motion on the floor. I know. Mm -hmm. Let me talk, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Mr. McLeod, the, uh, <laughs> the property as it is right now, so the, the area, I guess, between David off and the existing center right now. What is that zoned? Right now, the the entire property shown here in the highlight is zoned office under the conditional rezoning agreement. Mm -hmm. so okay. What was it zoned before the conditional zoning re agreement? That that area in between. The vacant area was zoned single family residential. Okay. And under the. Um, under typical office rezoning like that, um, or under typical office zoning, I should say, what would be the, the requirement at the northern portion? Are, is, it, is there always a masonry wall requirement separating office from residential? Realistically, yes. So the, the, the ordinance offers two options. So one is a six-foot high wall with parking immediately against it. Um, that would satisfy ordinance requirements. The ordinance also does provide for a green belt with a double row of evergreens um, along that area, which is 15 to 20 feet or so. Um, and we have very few situations in the city where that's ever been utilized. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, personally, I, I'm hearing that the issue is sound, but, you know, I always try to make a decision based on the facts that are presented. And, 
and I, I don't have any facts that the proposal would uh, be any worse for sound than, or any, any better or any worse for sound than a six foot masonry wall. Now, it may be the case. Um, do we, do, and do, do you know of any studies or any, do you have any information regarding a noise study about this particular piece of property or in more general terms, a masonry wall versus a wooden fence with a row of arbor varieties and trees? Um, in terms of specific study, the, the, the general ideology is, is that a, a solid masonry wall has always been the traditional way to buffer things. Um, there is some contrary ideals, though, that indicate that if you have two incredibly hard surfaces, one being a building, another one being a concrete wall, that noises will actually reverberate off of one another and actually bounce noise back and forth and, and not solve the issue. And that was part of the idea or part of the I, I thought of having additional greenscape, which would then help capture some of that noise, so to speak. So. You know, the idea is that you're, you're placing a physical barrier between the noise source and the actual residences. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not a sound expert, but I can't imagine that noise necessarily travels through wood any different than necessarily masonry. With all things being said, this is a shadow box type fence, which has some opening to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, com looking at it directly, it's solid. Uh, if you look at it on an angle, there's obviously some, some air space in there. So, um, you know, realistically, the, from our standpoint, the thought of having the, the wood fence in addition to the landscaping element kind of provided maybe the best of both worlds, so to speak, a physical element as well as a green element that would help, you know, soften the noise capacity. Okay. Well, I, uh, I would be comfortable approving the item as it's presented. I don't think there's been any finding that the noise, and while I'm, I'm sympathetic and understanding of the residents' concerns, I don't think there's been anything presented that the noise would be an issue there uh, or that it wouldn't be properly mitigated by the plan that's been presented. But counting the votes, uh, they certainly aren't there. So what I would say is that I think rather than rejecting this and um, and finding no compromise, it would be better if, if I would respectfully request that Councilwoman Koski withdraw her motion in favor of a motion to postpone. Mrs. Koski? Yes, I'll withdraw my motion and let you uh, work on it. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I can't make a motion. <laughs> I was about to find out if I could. Doesn't Barbara have to withdraw her support? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so is there anyone who'd make a motion to uh, I have to draw my withdraw my support. support. Okay. <laughs> I did. <laughs> is there anyone who'd like to make a motion to post or I let me phrase it this way. Um, Mr. Manna, May seventh or May twenty first, do you have a preference between those dates? May seventh. Okay. That's that's my preference too, and if you can get it done then so yeah. I'd entertain a motion, Mrs. Okay. Sarko. Um the other thing that Mr. Manna brought up, and I want to know if Mr. McLeod could work on this, is I noticed that before this decision was even made, he wanted to know if he could have some kind of approvals in order to start the building. Is that anything that we can consider? So through the chair to Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Um, from my standpoint, I, I think that answer is yes. I think realistically the plan would move forward under the premise. Essentially, it would need to be processed as the wall is going in. Um, until such point that the wall is not going in, if that is ultimately the decision of council. So um, I think engineering, since that's where the project is right now, would continue under that premise that, okay, we're mm -hmm. planning for the site for the wall to be there until told otherwise. It shouldn't make a great difference um, in terms of the engineering practices going on. So I, I think between planning and engineering, we'll figure something out. And I think it would be a good statement of faith on both of our parts that we're going to resolve this and if we can do that to help them. So nothing further. Okay. I'd entertain a motion to postpone this item to the May 7th, 2019 City Council meeting. So I'll, I'll make the motion. Support. Uh, it's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. So we'll see you back here May 7th. Thank you very Mr. much. Mm -hmm. 
All right, next item on our agenda tonight is an ordinance introduction, and this is to consider an introduction of an ordinance amending the registration requirements for temporary signs pursuant to zoning ordinance number 278. We have a presentation from our city planner, Chris McLeod, Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council, Mr. Vanderpool again. Uh, before you tonight is a potential introduction uh, for an ordinance amendment regarding the city sign ordinance. Um, as a little background, uh, the City Council uh, at their December 18th meeting um, directed City Administration to research and bring forward for consideration an ordinance amendment uh, in regards to the registration requirements for temporary signs uh, under the zoning ordinance itself. So as part of that overall review, obviously city, our city legal team was brought in uh, and they obviously were, were very, um, a very large part, part of that review of the ordinance. And so with that, I think we'll start off with a little bit of background um, from our assistant city attorney, uh, Nathan Petrusak, in terms of the basis of our registration requirements and then I'll get into the actual um, sign uh, registration requirements from there. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was reading something. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, and Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, back in 2015... Bring the microphone to yourself so we can hear you. Sorry about that. Back in um, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down its decision in Reed uh, versus Town of Gilbert, which essentially held that regulations that categorize signs based on the type of information they convey uh, and apply different standards to each of those content-based restrictions violate the First Amendment. Following this decision, the city amended its sign ordinance in 2016 uh, to come into compliance with Reed uh, by eliminating uh, any content-based categories and by regulating all temporary signs, regardless of viewpoint and subject matter, according to content-neutral standards such as square footage and size. Uh, as part of that 26th Amendment, we also reviewed the registration process required by the ordinance for temporary signs on vacant and non-residential properties, which is obviously what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, at the, back in 2016, at that time, the registration process was streamlined um, from what had existed since uh, 2000 in order to make it easier to register signs including uh, <coughs> registering signs online and by uh, eliminating the requirement that written consent be obtained from property owners in order to have a valid registration. Um, in 2016 and now, uh, we have had the opportunity to review the current registration process uh, in light of Reed and related case law since then. And a review of that case law confirms that the current registration process is constitutional. Uh, because it remains content neutral as it was back in 2016 and it advances the city's Supreme Court recognized interests in uh, controlling traffic, public safety, and avoiding blight. Um, therefore, you know, from a legal perspective, we believe that the current registration process is constitutional and that no change is necessary to the current registration process. And with that, I would turn it back over to Mr. McLeod to talk more about the current registration process. <laughs> and I'm available uh, to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you. So in terms of uh, some examples on the screen here in terms of temporary signs, um, and again, temporary signs in include a number, and these are non-commercial related signs um, that we're talking about here tonight. Um, so this is where our, the city's sign ordinance in terms of number and square footage and, and so forth uh, become prevalent because these are obviously uh, situations where we want to try to avoid situations such as this are more um, conducive to what the city's ordinance anticipates. So to help make sure that situations like this occur, our current sign ordinance for temporary signs takes into a couple different things, take, take, takes into account a couple different things. So right now, um, what we looked at was the regulations pertaining only to non-residential properties um, and the registration requirement for those. And yes, all of those signs for temporary purposes uh, need to be registered uh, with the city clerk's office. We also looked at the registration requirements for signs on all vacant properties, and that's regardless of zoning classification uh, or use types. And those, again, must also be registered with the clerk's office. Those are the signs that fall under the city's registration requirements. So as Nathan kind of alluded to, the, the city for a long time has had some form registration requirements so uh, the current ordinance again from 2016 forward 
kind of continued this tradition or this longstanding practice. Some of the things that we've done over time, though, to help streamline the process, uh, again, is that we've, we've eliminated the written permission of the property owner. Uh, that was seen as a very cumbersome process, so now the registration requirement, we'll walk through that in one, one moment, um, but now eliminates that requirement to try to help and make it a little easier for everyone to, to do. Uh, we also uh, opened up our online portal uh, for registration. Again, that'll be part of what we walk through. Um, or you can still do it in person if you're more comfortable in doing that. But the online registration has really created a, an ease of operation for those that are, are tech savvy or those that are you know, even internet savvy to begin with. You don't necessarily have to be a, a, a whiz at it to do it. So registration though, and I wanna stress this, and so we have these requirements and to say that signage for, for non-residential properties particular let's say our, our 40 square feet for political signage or temporary signage or uh, for non-commercial based sign requirements to understand which signs if there's multiple signs on the property um, and if that sign is legal to even be there in the first place the registration process is the essence of how we get to enforcement um, without that registration process it really becomes difficult to then try to communicate with the landowner, find the landowner in the first place, um, or the business owner, whoever that may be, or someone in charge of that can answer for the landowner um, in terms of how we deal with that sign. So how do we get that sign to make sure it's in compliance with the ordinance itself? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the registration process. So the online portal itself, again, is, is through the city clerk's website, or obviously you can come through the clerk's counter, uh, the forms available there um, in terms of providing there I'm sure the clerk's office would be more than happy uh, to help you walk through that process if you need to if you need some help doing it um, register I think it's important to to understand that that process doesn't necessarily a approve a sign it's simply that it's confirmed for compliance to say yes there is the ability to place additional um, temporary signage on that property it can still be within the confines of the ordinance itself um, that registration process again gets sent to code enforcement, it's constantly updated on an ongoing basis. So that way code enforcement can continue to review and monitor the situation in terms of making sure that um, all the city's ordinances relative to temporary signage is being met. We've already talked about the fact that on non-residential property specifically, uh, there's a 40 square foot maximum requirement. Um, and just of, of note, clerk's office last year alone received 464 temporary sign registrations. Over the last four years or so, there's been nearly 1,200 registrations. So it shows that a number of people and a number of signs um, have been registered under this process. I mean, so if the system wasn't working, that number I would suspect would be much lower. So again, kind of walking through the registration process itself. So you get to the city's website, you go to the clerk's website. On the left-hand side, there's a quick link to say short-term temporary signs. You click on that. It takes you to uh, the short-term temporary sign registration page. You click on that where it says short-term registration and often in your off and going. So it's simply, we'll walk through each page clip it uh, shown here, but um, so basically the forms can be submitted anywhere. They can be submitted online. Um, they can be submitted at city clerk's office. If you're doing it online, you can literally sit at home and do this. You can be in your car and do this. Obviously it's, it's mobile app ready and do it at any particular time. So whenever you have free time, you don't have to get to City Hall between business hours uh, to make sure that you get your, your sign submitted. Um, again, anytime, any place. Registration process online should only take several minutes uh, for each registration. Um, the forms can still be processed in person. We understand that there's some people in the city that either just don't like doing business over the internet or they just don't feel comfortable with it. So obviously we still do that in person. And again, I want to convey that the fact that these are, it's not an approval for a sign. It's just simply confirming uh, that you're in compliance with the ordinance or not. So the next, as you continue to scroll through the registration pages, these are the sites that you see. So you're, you're just clicking on whether this is a new sign or a renewal. Um, we even went to the extent of saying, you can sign up for an automatic renewal on our ordinance. So again, trying to make it as easy as possible um, in terms of this. If you want, or if you want to do a renewal at a later time, you can do that as well. Um, so putting in some, some address information, where it's going to be, the size, and then a brief description. So you can either simply put in a description to say I have a blue sign with white lettering that says whatever it may say, or you can upload a photo. So you can simply snap a picture with your phone or your digital camera and say I'm just going to upload it right to the site. That way you don't even have to write a description. 
again, try to provide you as many easy options as we can to make sure we understand what the sign is and what it's, what it's, what it's doing. Um, name of the person uh, or authority to allow the temporary sign. And then basically we're saying that you're, in essence, vouching for the fact that you've contacted this person, you have the right uh, to put that sign there. And then some, some, again, some certification statements here, and then kind of a digital signature, if you will, and then your contact information. So this is the information that code receives. So again, so when code goes out and, and when temporary signs are starting to appear, um, they take a look at, okay, this particular address has this kind of square footage on it. So if there's a, let's say the top one at 2383 14 Mile Road, a fourth sign appears, they'll say, okay, here's the first three to register. The fourth sign isn't registered. We know to pull that one. Without this kind of information, either one, we're going in and asking the business owner and putting them in a very bad position saying, okay, which sign do you want us to pull on the spot, so to speak, or they have a very short time frame. They have four hours to decide which one gets pulled. Um, and, or they have, if we can't find the owner, we can't find a manager, then all of a sudden we're kind of in the administrative tailspin, so to speak, to say, okay, how do we contact this person? Where are they at? Let's get an answer or the review process is longer. And if we can't contact someone, then all the signs get approved or get removed from the site. Uh, and that's not good for anybody. So again, the registration process creates order and creates a, a systematic way of moving through the ordinance and especially in terms of enforcement. So what have we done since the initial request from council? So the ordinance was obviously drafted, um, the potential review of it. Uh, we administrative obviously took on took this head on. Uh, so there was discussion at the Planning Commission. We held a, a public hearing March 14th. Uh, there were several issues raised at the Planning Commission. Um, one of those was whether, uh, you know, what was the process for showing what the sign said or what the sign was. Um, and obviously once the Planning Commission understood that the fact that you could either upload a picture or you could provide a description and it wasn't necessarily that we're approving a particular message, it was simply for description purposes, they were satisfied with that. And the other biggest question was, is city administration having an issue with this? And that answer was basically city administration is not having an issue with it. it. Again, it provides order and provides the ability to do enforcement. So the Planning Commission's recommendation was that there's no changes to the existing ordinance. That's what they sent up to uh, from their March 14th meeting. And city administration, both from the Planning Department as well from uh, Community Development Department, also recommends no change to the existing ordinance. Again, uh, the concern would be enforcement. How is how does this get implemented? How does the city's ordinance get implemented? And how does enforcement incur? Um, and I think in terms of it create a lot more administration and it would create a lot more uh, chaos, so to speak, in terms of which signs get removed, which signs don't, or simply removing all signs and again, not making anyone happy. So should council decide to move forward, uh, we did prepare two different amendments versions. Version one, which is in front of you, um, removes the requirements solely on the non-residential properties. It keeps registration on vacant properties. The thought process being is that at least with the non-residential properties, we have someone potentially to talk to. We have a manager of the property. We have a property owner that we could hopefully find. And again, that's not always as easy as it sounds, but uh, this is this is version one that, we're, you know, that was presented to. And again, um, the idea is, is that if we have to go in and talk to the, the commercial owners, if we have that registration, the decision's made for everybody. Um, we just simply go by order. Um, if we have to go in and talk to a business owner, they have to make, basically pick and choose. And at that point, um, they don't necessarily want to be in that decision-making process. Um, and then again, the registration still allows for enforcement on vacant properties in the current manner that it's, uh, that it's occurring. Version two, which is in front of you, would remove the registration requirement from all properties. Um, kind of going back again through uh, for the non-residential properties, we would still be putting the business owners in that particular situation where they have to pick and choose which signs go, which ones stay, or ultimately if there's not a decision, we'd simply remove them all. Same thing would occur for vacant properties. And again, those are much more difficult to track down property owners. Many of our vacant properties are owned by either conglomerates in terms of overall uh, property groups, or they're owned by uh, non-resident or non-vacant uh, landowners uh, that are hard to reach from Florida, from uh, from California, um, that are hard to reach and track down, especially in the time frame that we're dealing with for the signs themselves. So again, this situation would likely revert to a situation where we're removing all signs 
uh, from the property itself. So again, I just want to reiterate the fact that how we've gotten to this point, Planning Commission at their public hearing recommended no changes, administration recommends no changes. Um, and so with that, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions that council may have. All right, thank you, Mr. McLeod. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Mrs. Early. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. I do have a question. When you started the presentation, you said that the registration is essential for enforcement, which means it's not required. Um, then when you did the presentation, I, I agree with the one that said that no registration should be required because as somebody whose sign has been stolen, the city had taken signs that were well placed and they decided to remove my signs from the properties. Uh, will they need be, I'm, I'm, I, have, I deal with the property owners. We know if they will say yes or not. Will they need to be better for us to tell them, you, this is a, the requirement, you can only allow, the, and we do, you can only be allowed to certain amount of uh, signs in your property. And then they will decide if they will do it or not. I agree that having this registration process is just to track where the signs are gonna be going, which is a way of enforcement, but also the city is not implementing these regulations to the people like me, my signs get taken away. And then I have, for a sign that I pay two or three dollars, I had to go and pay five dollars to the city to, rec to have the sign given back to me. Um, I think we should stop requiring for the owners to, um, for the city to have that registration. Let the owners decide they know. It's not that they are in California, if they are in California, wherever they are, the managers talk to them and the person, the owner that will allow the sign knows the candidate. We are not putting them in a situation that they have to decide between a Democrat and a Republican. The property owner knows it. Going to the vacancy lots, we know who gets those vacancy lots. We know it's those candidates who had the signs there has been registered, we never will find out unless we FOIA those documents. So I'm all for to removing all this, those registrations. It's not necessary. It's, it's like a plane with the candidates that are new candidates or candidates like me that has been, the city had done certain things with my signs. And I say the city because I know where the signs end up. Some signs were stolen from the opposition. I mean, stop the requirements. Let the owner decide, and they have been doing it. Uh, they have been great with the candidates. Go for option two, thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Early. Anyone else on this item? Mr. Jefferson. Um, Charles Jefferson, Sterling Heights. This is uh, over the, the last several years. This has been the most <laughs> talked about ordinance here at Sterling Heights ever. And I do mean ever. I've been not coming down here 24, 25 years now. So I, I'm pretty well familiar with this ordinance. I hope this is the last time. I, I do not, I hope you folks get this right. I do not want to see this come back in December with some kind of, uh, some people getting upset because of the sign ordinance. Hopefully you guys can, can knock this out tonight so we can at least have this thing around for a few years because it seems like after every election that this sign ordinance is, comes up and it's a throwing in somebody's side. Um, my main question is how, uh, how do we get this to uh, the people of the state or to uh, county uh, Countywide elections, state elections, does this infer to those people as well? Um, how do we get that information to them and their people? And uh, how long after the election can people leave out their signs? And what's, is there a fine for leaving your sign out too long after the election? Uh, 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Anyone else on this item? Not, uh, Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Uh, resolved to introduce uh, suggested action number two, uh, retaining registration requirement for temporary signs on vacant parcels and eliminating registration on owner-occupied non-residential properties. I guess it goes, resolved to introduce an ordinance eliminating the registration requirement for temporary signage prior to placement on occupied non-residentially zoned property only pursuant to section 28.13L13 of zoning ordinance number 278. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mr. Radke? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this sign ordinance in its current form, in my opinion, is unconstitutional. I've always argued this, even when I sat in the audience with you, Mr. Jefferson, I believe it's unconstitutional. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Petruska, I have a few questions. Mr. Petruski, can you name me a community that has a sign ordinance like ours? Sure. Um, during, our, <clears throat> during our review process uh, this time around, we uh, took a look at Michigan and took a look mm -hmm. across the United States uh, to determine uh, if there were other uh, municipalities elsewhere that were doing it like this. And we did not identify that in Michigan, uh, the village of Bel Air has a registration ordinance uh, or sign ordinance that has registration that mm -hmm. is very similar to the one uh, that was uh, adopted by the city of Sterling Heights. And that was also a, it was a post read um, sign ordinance that they adopted. Uh, the city of Dearborn also has a registration requirement, uh, though, though theirs is more restrictive than the city of Sterling Heights is because I think they require a $40 fee per registration. So mm -hmm. that's completely unconstitutional. <laughs> well, and then also uh, just taking a look nationwide, we did identify that uh, Ventura County, California, uh, Shelburne, Vermont and Allentown, Pennsylvania um, all have uh, similar uh, content new neutral registration requirements that focus on the description, the size, and the permission from the owner, et cetera. Um, but that was, that was sort of just a, a brief snapshot of places that might have it, because you really, when you, when you look at it, you have to actually do a deep dive into all of their codes of ordinances to read the sign ordinances to determine whether they're content neutral or not, of and, and to, to compare them with ours. But that's a small sampling of the ones that we know to exist, and I'm sure there's quite a few more. Sure, uh, and don't go anywhere. I sure. have a few more statements. I, I like the pictures in our packet. Uh, the, the terrible signs that have been displayed here, one is Oxnard, California, and the other one is Idaho. So I see that we've, we've gone nationwide to find the worst possible sign picture in the country to display because I guess we weren't finding them in Michigan. I don't know. But on top of that, I guess, how is the pre-registration requirement not a prior restraint on the First Amendment? That's, that's actually a really good question. Um, and it's not a prior restraint uh, for two reasons, really. Uh, the first one is um, the sign ordinance and the registration process are content neutral. They don't, they don't have any bearing on the particular message that's being conveyed, whether it's the viewpoint or the subject matter. It focuses solely on square footage and, and size of signs. And it treats all signs, all temporary use signs, exactly the same. So from that perspective, it's a content neutral uh, ordinance, and it's also narrowly tailored um, to get at these specific issues that arise. And this basically being that it directly addresses concerns that uh, regarding properties that have a high likelihood of signs causing distracted driving on major roadways, confusion with directional signs, and, ba and essentially the proliferation of unsightly blight. And so, because it's content neutral, because it's narrowly tailored, it's a con it's it's the registration ordinance and the registration requirements are constitutionally permissible. Uh, the other factor that weighs in in terms of not being a prior restraint on speech is that this, as Mr. McLeod uh, commented on, the, si the signed registrations, they're merely accepted by the city and they're effective upon filing. The city isn't actually approving the registration based on any sort of subjective standards or uh, they're not content based. And so the process it's, it's not considered an impermissible prior restraint on but speech. But you'd argue, I'd argue to you that having to go and get all that information in one place and put it online, one, takes up the time of the person applying, and two, it requires a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a, a way to prevent signs by making it a hassle to register them, which, which arguably is a prior restraint. You're trying to make it as difficult as possible to put up a, a, a temporary sign. 
Well, I, I think you're uh, respectfully you're entitled to your, your opinion on in that regard. But from a from a legal standpoint, in terms of what is and what is not a prior restraint on speech, those things aren't, aren't factored in in terms of what is considered a prior restraint on speech. It, it's, the, the fact of the matter is the city isn't approving these registrations and the ordinance and the registration are content neutral anyway. Let me ask you one more question then. Of course. Have any of these sign ordinances that require pre-registration been challenged in court? Has there any case law on if these are legal or not? I, I, I did a search on uh, the last couple of days and I have not seen uh, any, any recent case law pertaining to registration ordinance specifically is one, one like this where the registration is not approved. I mean, you see it's a lot. Un, it's untested. You so. see a lot of things with permits and licenses, but this is this is a different case where there's no actual approval by the city. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Petruski. Thank you. Um, you know, we talked about here, uh, we, we can't assume signs are in compliance or not, but I think that the most common sense problem is if a sign is on someone's property, I own commercial property. And if someone puts a sign up on my property that I don't want to be on my property, I go out there and I take it down, which is my right as the property owner. So I don't think the idea that by having them register it somehow, we know that it's in compliance. I think that's just the, the opposite of the fact. Someone knows if the property is in compliance or not. The reason I decided to take the middle option here instead of just going for a complete elimination of the registration requirement is that I, I, I agree with you that vacant property, it can be hard to find an owner. And those can become sign farms or a place where signs could congregate for no reason. And then we have a situation where we have a ton. But I think on an occupied building, if they don't want your sign up there, it's not going to last long. And the idea that the city has to somehow get between that property owner and the speech they want to convey, it seems to be very, I just think it's confusing and, and wrong. Uh, you know, visitors currently pick and choose what signs they're up there. And for the city to say, no, we need you to put it in writing so we can pick and choose at our, at our discretion when we enforce our codes, I think that that's, that's quite silly and that's why I'm gonna to vote to, uh, to, to change this, this assignment ordinance. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Radke. Anyone else, Council? Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Through the chair to uh, Nathan Petrusik. Petrusik, did I say your name wrong? <laughs> I'm sorry, Petrusik, Petrusik, my fault. <laughs> uh, a little education here, please. Temporary signs, when we did this ordinance, uh, and directed um, this to temporary signs, what all is included under temporary signs? We're talking about political signs, we're talking about um, I sell hairbrushes, uh, uh, house for sale, uh, open house today. What is a temporary sign? I, I would defer to uh Mr. McLeod, as to the actual definition of what a temporary sign is, but it, it does, it, it doesn't include things that are that are temporary signs that would be for commercial purposes. Those are handled under a separate uh, special or uh, a special use permit. Um, but it would include things like uh, estate sale signs. If there somebody put up an estate sale sign at a at a gas station, pointing a direction of a particular ga uh, estate sale. Um, if there was a if a church put out. Uh, a sandwich board that indicated that it was having a weekly fr fish fry during Lent. Um, that would something that would have to be registered. Um, craft show signs for a local high school are just a, a couple of examples that kind of come to mind immediately. But really, um, any sort of non-commercial sign that it would be for a special event uh, type thing um, that is not all already getting a, a special or a use permit um, would be covered as as a temporary sign. And your commercial signs would be. A commercial sign? Uh, again, I would defer to Mr. McLeod as the actual definition of a commercial okay. sign, but if it's, my understanding is that if it's essentially, um, if it's a sign that's related to what the purpose of the business is, that it's a commercial sign. Mr. McLeod. Um, I think Mr. Petruzek had hit him pretty much dead on both in both occurrences. Um, for temporary signage, particularly the amendments or the discussion here tonight is for the non-commercial temporary sign provisions. Um, so again, that's conveying a message. It's not conveying a commercial uh, conveyance. It's simply saying, I have a message to uh, whatever mission you're on, so to speak, 
um, or as you noted, political signs are one of the main ones, but they're not the only ones. There's a number of different signs. Commercial signage is things such as grand openings or uh, $5 haircuts today kind of signs. Um, and the, those types of signs are done through the planning office uh, as part of a temporary use permit. And so uh, when we redid the ordinance in 2016, we tweaked that a little further um, to, to further differentiate coming out of Reed. Um, you had to make sure that the city was still in good standing. So that's really the delineation is, is commercial versus non-commercial. Um, and again, tonight's deliberation is solely on the non-commercial temporary sign provision. So by leaving this in place, this gives you control over people that are having special events so that you know where they are, uh, what they're putting out there, uh, why do you want this to stay for all the temporary signs? So again, this would just be for the non-commercial speech. So anything that's a special event per se, um, realistically, for instance, if a church has a, a large multiple day festival, we typically deal with that under a temporary use permit. Um, with that, they get a sign to go along with that. Um, one of the things that would have to probably be ancillary to that, though, is if they put multiple signs throughout the community advertising that event, um, you know, we would have to address that. But going back to the temporary non-commercial signage, again, I think anyone that's putting up these signs, if someone says, I have a number of messages I want to convey on my property, um, the city's registration policy would say, okay, we know that these signs were the first come first serve so that's not a it's not the city deciding which one goes which one stays it's simply the order in which they were registered so it takes the discretion out of it um, I, that that message was conveyed several times here there the idea of what the registration process is designed to take the discretion out of it so there isn't like well i like that sign i'm going to keep that one i don't like that one it's going to go it's simply saying sign one sign two sign three we're here and they were registered first, sign four goes. So it provides order to the system. Um, without it, code enforcement, and I've had a number of conversations with them you know, since this whole thing started you know, several months ago, and they are very concerned about how they would enforce the ordinance. Um, and the fact that it, it's going to cause so much chaos and so much additional administrative work to try to track down owners of properties, managers of properties, because even if if you have a single building it's one thing to say okay i'm going to go in and talk to that single business owner or that single property owner if you have a shopping center you have 10 different tenants in there the 10 different tenants aren't the ones that probably said the sign can go up or can't go up it's the property management company that's not there um, that may only visit their site once a month or twice a month or whenever there's an issue so at that point they very well may not know what signs are up what signs aren't up so it does become more of an issue and then trying to track down that management company, the right person within that management company, and then convey you know, what signs are allowed to go up, what signs aren't. So the registration process, again, provides order and provides some sort of streamlined process for city uh, code enforcement to take, take action. And again, I want to stress the fact that you know, we're, we're basically 36 square miles. We have thousands upon thousands of tens of thousands of properties and we have 12 code enforcement officers that are part-time and they're trying to keep all this in line and the fact that signage is only one portion of their duties they have grass issues they have weeds they have parking lots they have disrepair of buildings so they're trying to take care of all this so again anything that we could do to help them uh, make their jobs easier and more streamlined i think would be beneficial have you had any complaints? Uh, how long have we had this particular uh, portion uh, since 2016? Well, the registration process in some form or another has been around since about 2000. Two. I mean, so it, we've continued to, to tweak it. I'm talking about the temporary sign registration. Has it been that long? Mm -hmm. In yes. some form. Mm -hmm. In some form, yes. Okay. Have you had any complaints about that other than political complaints <laughs> uh, I, I can't speak to I mean I, I don't know of any myself um, you know I, I think anytime you, you put someone through a process there's the potential for that but I think realistically the, the city has done such a job in terms of try to create 
streamlining and efficiency and ease at every step of the way of this process. You know, I, again, realistically, to enter in your information uh, is it's relatively easy. I mean, if if you're if you're good at the internet, I mean, within a couple of minutes you can have your sign registered. Um, I mean, and it's it's a very simple process. If you come here to City Hall, uh, again, the clerk's office, I'm sure, would be happy to help you fill out the paperwork. I mean, so again, every aspect of this is designed to create as easy of a process to register your sign as possible. And um, unlike Dearborn, the city doesn't obviously charge for it. Um, and there's not really necessarily a review process. So it's not like, well, we'll give you an answer in five days from now. The city simply says, okay, there's available room here. Uh, the sign uh, registration is confirmed and we move forward. And That's you know, basically all we do is number of signs and does it fit? Correct, number of signs, square footage, um, and that you, we have a description so in case something does go awry, we know which sign is being registered. And that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Koski. Anyone else? Mayor um, Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Mr. McLeod. So in your presentation, you told us that in 2018, 464 permits were filed. I'd love to know how many signs were pulled because there were no permits. <laughs> uh, any ballpark figure? I, unfortunately, I don't have a ballpark number, but I know it's, um, you know, every year we look for additional compliance. Um, but realistically, there are a number of signs that um, that were pulled. As the, the registration process has gotten easier and, and as new people have come into the community, um, more and more people have been registering once, you know, when they realize that that's the city's policy and the city's requirements. Um, but there's always going to be non-compliance with signage. I mean, and whether it's for either a non-registered sign or whether it's a sign in a wrong location or it's a sign that's above and beyond our ordinance requirements, there's a multitude of things going on. Um, so the registration process is just one portion of that. Okay, and it, to be perfectly clear, because in the past it's always been suggested that it's so cumbersome on the business owner, these permits. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, a business owner has to do for this permit submission, correct? Uh, that's correct. They just, in theory, there's a conversation between the person placing the sign and the business owner, and that's it. Okay. And then it's all on the person placing the sign in terms of their requirement or their, their, they're the ones bearing the weight of it. And that business owner has the right to rescind a permit if let's say they have a, a fourth person or event comes along and they prefer that fourth event over one of the, th the three that they already have, can they rescind one of those permits and issue a new permit? They st they're still the property owner, so they still have the right to say who gets to put signs and things on their property. I mean, right. so if they decide I don't like sign A for whatever reason anymore, um, they have the right to pull that sign. And that's a conversation that then they should have with the person who placed the sign there originally. Right, okay. So it was also suggested, you know, why did we go to California to come up with pictures? We don't have to go to California. We can go to the east, we can go to the south, we can go to the north. Because all three of those communities look like blighted corners through every election cycle. So it doesn't matter where the pictures were taken because it happens all over the this, this state, all around us. And because we have this in place, we don't look like that. And I like that. I think that's a good thing. Um, it was also brought up, you know, um, signs being removed or stolen. I, I can probably rest assured that every candidate sitting up here has had signs stolen. And it's not... It's not our code enforcement officers taking them. It's whomever taking them. But I can say in all of my election cycles, I've lost signs. So that's not something that's uncommon. It happens all the time. It's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, business owners, um, they really do decide who they want to have on their property and who they don't. So you're not you're not infringing on their freedom of speech. That's, their, that's who they choose. They give permission for those, those, um, business, those activities to be on, advertised on their property. So I have no issue at all with the ordinance as it stands. Um, 
I, I would hate to see um, what our city would look like if there's no permits. Um, right now, I, we take pride in, in our community in every way, shape, and form. And to bring that kind of blight, I don't care if it's for three months or, or three years, I, I just don't think that's what the residents of, of the city expect from us. Um, and I think you have answered all my questions. I have nothing further. So I am in favor of keeping the ordinance as it is in the books right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Yannis. Yes, Mayor. Uh, through the through the chair to Mr. McLeod. So if if I wanted to if I wanted to go and uh, online and secure every corner business in the in the city without talking to the business owner, I can do that, right? Mr. McLeod. <laughs> Good point. So if you're attesting to that and signing the documents that you've done that, um, and then at that point it's a verification. If there is a if there is a discrepancy between information, then ultimately we go back to the property owner and say, was this information correct? So so that's that's part of the problem. Though, going back to the property owner, isn't that isn't that correct? Because once I put my um, uh, once I file that I put a sign somewhere, and several people file that they put a sign somewhere, and you hit the maximum square footage, and the owner doesn't want that sign there, <clears throat> sort of uh, the situation that uh, Councilwoman Schmidt brought up. Well, until the property owner actually notifies the clerk, it's still in our database that there's these people have priority, right? Go to we'll steal their sign. So it's <laughs> so it's 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 a rather arcane system. So. Um, having said that, because we do have the square foot, so I will say, um, colleagues and, and uh, people in the audience, because we do have this square footage limitation, I don't know how we get around not, not doing this. I mean, people could just jam, jam signs in, and the guy who owns the, the shell station at, at uh, Plumbrook and, and Van Dyke, he doesn't know. He's just somebody jammed a sign in there. And I went online and I registered that I, I got a sign in that. And who's he to say, right? He doesn't know. He just, you know, he let one person put a sign in it, two signs, whatever. So I, I just, you know, frankly, I would just like to see, uh, no, I won't go down there. I will just say this. I, I think uh, uh, the situation we have is not a perfect one, uh, but I do agree with, uh, at this point, because it is the system that we have, it's probably a better system than just allowing people to randomly stick signs in the ground and hope the owner doesn't say anything. So I, I will not support this uh, motion. Um, I would prefer everything stay the way it is. Thank you. All right. Anyone Mayor Taylor? Else? Mrs. Zarko. Um, it's not going to come any surprise that um, I won't be voting for this motion. In fact, I actually objected it to it being brought up to uh, administration to do anything about changing the ordinance because I didn't want them to put the time and the man hours into doing something that I thought was good to begin with. First of all, um, there's a lot of things that were said tonight that I agree with and I disagree with. Um, I don't, first of all, uh, the current ordinance that we have right now, I think provides equality for all and that's people and events. Um, that when you place that sign, uh, you know, it's, um, it doesn't matter what the verbiage is, if you've gone in and gotten a permit to put that sign there, that's fine. And um, so we're not stepping on anybody's uh, freedom of speech. We're not editing their speech. We're not telling them, you know, they can't say that. Um, I'm sure that we do have ordinance, but probably uh, ordinance uh, verbiage for that. But basically, if you um, having an event or if you're a person running for office, it's the same for everybody. The other thing is, is I have a great sign location. I Shaner's on the side of my house, and I know what the regulations are for signage. And if you want to talk to Mr. Romano right now, he was upset because I reached my square footage, and when he wanted to put a sign up, I had to tell him, Joe, I can't do it because I've already committed those sign locations to somebody else. That's simple. Um, I don't know why if you put a sign on somebody's business without permission and the owner notices it, why it's his responsibility to go out there and take it down. 
because it shouldn't have been there to begin with. So why does he have to put the man hours or why does he have to take it down? He didn't want it there to begin with. Somebody else put it there and they shouldn't have. So it's not a good argument that I feel is that, um, that, the, that the business owner will just take it down. Um, the other thing is, is if you go through the city and as Mr. McLeod explained, the number of code enforcement officers we have, it's not unusual. And I, if you go to 15 and Shaner or any of the busy intersections, you'll see signs come up after five o'clock on Friday and 80% of them will be coming down at eight o'clock on Monday morning. People know exactly when to put those up. They know they're in violation if they're um, in the right of ways, but it does happen. And my biggest thing is, is that, you know, um, I've had candidates at all levels of government and um, that have said to us, is, you know, is the ordinance cumbersome? Or they might make a joke about it, about saying, you know, in Sterling Heights, we know that we can't do this, but they respect our ordinance. And they know how we want the city to what they want the city to look like. So it's like, okay, if that's your rule, we'll follow your rule. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I just don't see uh, where this needs to be changed. And I think for us to be up here changing an ordinance that, if we change it, we're going to benefit from is self-serving. And that's probably the biggest problem I have with this: is it self-serving if we change it? Um, I think that's it. Okay. That's it. Mrs. Sorowski. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I happen to agree with Mr. Jefferson. We have heard this enough, and I've only been on council. This is going, coming on my fourth, third, third term. I am done hearing about it. I would like to keep it like it is. We do not want the blight. We do not want the extra signs that stay out there. I drive all the way all over the state and smaller communities that don't have these ordinances, those signs stay up for sometimes years. There isn't any, any way they can really enforce it, but hope that the property owners or the people come back and take them down. So this is appropriate to have an ordinance. Yes, as Mr. Yanis said, it is not perfect. There is always, you know, maybe if we tweak it this way, if we tweak it that way, I think that we should be done tweaking it for now and let's let it be and let's let it work with them. We've heard it enough. I think every political candidate knows the rules now because they've, if they haven't violated them accidentally, then there'll be, you know, things will come up in their face anyway. We, <clears throat> this is not about public safety. This is not about good services, this is a sign ordinance. I would like to have this put to rest and I will be voting to just keep it the same. That's all I have, Mayor Taylor. All right, thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Um, I will say this, when I first got on city council, this was something that I was uh, passionate about and um, that was almost 10 years ago. And somebody, somebody told me, you know, Taylor, you, you try to change everything in an instant and in government, it's like turning a ship and it takes a long time. And I've been turning this ship for 10 years and I'll keep turning the ship. Mm -hmm. It's not going away if it doesn't tonight. And, but that's okay. That's the way that government should work. You don't just say, okay, well, uh, city council decided this uh, 10 years ago, so we better just keep it that way. Um, you know, I, I kind of take issue with this idea that it's not public safety. It's not, um, it's not something important. It's, it's speech and it's, what our founders determined uh, was the most important thing that didn't quite make it in the Constitution to begin with, but it's the First Amendment to our Constitution, speech. And um, maybe uh, we can have a good you know, debate about whether it's constitutional or not. Frankly, I don't really care. Um, it, you know, if you, ask, if you ask one attorney, they might say it, it is, and you ask another, they might say it isn't. But uh, to me, it's, it's what is fair and what is the, the proper thing to do. Um, let me, I guess, ask a question, Mr. Uh, McLeod. Uh, based on the way our ordinance and our sign permit, whatever you want to call it, requirement is right now, who, uh, who has the authority to give a candidate 
the ability to place a sign on a non-residential piece of property. So realistically to be the property uh, man or the property owner or the property manager. So okay. Whoever has authority to act on behalf of that property. Let's say that a commercial piece of property is owned by an LLC and it has three members. Which member, and all three of them own 33 and a third percent, which one is it has the authority to give permission? Whoever has the right to speak on that behalf. Okay, what if it's managed by, the, do, do, you, do you look at the operating agreement? We do not go to that level, okay. we absolutely So have let's say it's an LLC with three members and they've got, manage, they're managed by a manager, okay? And the manager is a company. Do you look at that management company's operating agreement? Let's say it's a, let's say that the property is owned by an LLC with multiple members and a manager and the, the property is leased out to a, uh, or the property has a commercial development on it that has a multi-tenant development and um, each tenant is owned by a different company and those companies have uh, store managers, the operating entities have uh, operating agreements, they have multiple members. Who has the right to say whether that sign is properly placed or not? So it's like an eighth grade story problem. Right, so I think, <laughs> so I think the answer, you, you and I both know the answer. You don't know. Our, and and it's not your it's not our role as a government to get in between the candidate mm -hmm. and the property owner, right? Because I know for a fact that if I go to some property owner that that has some convoluted owner, and there there are many like that, right? Like if I go to Lakeside Mall and I go to Dominic's and I say, hey, can I put up a sign? Who does does Dominic give me the right to put up a sign? Does Jerry give me the right to put up a sign? Who gets the right? Does, who, 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 who can tell me? So that is not something that the government should be getting in the middle of. And, and frankly, you don't. I know this because I can submit to Henry's point what I thought he was going to, the point I thought he was going to be making is I can go online and I can gobble up a whole bunch of good corners and just say, I've got the property owner's permission and you guys don't go and check, right? You just authorize it. So you're saying code is in con you're saying code is concerned about how are we going to enforce this? We only have 12 people. Um, they don't know who to go to track down to find out who has permission here and who doesn't have permission here. Well, neither does the city clerk. So the city clerk is granting me or any other candidate the ability to go place a sign somewhere. And, 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 and using that as prima facie evidence that I have just because, just by me or anyone else submitting uh, a request, you're saying we're not, we're not looking at the substance of it. We're just seeing, is there enough square footage there? Yep, okay, now I have, now that you're using that as prima facie evidence that I have the authority to place that sign there. And you're saying, if you force us to actually go and, and find out whether the candidate has authority, that's going to be difficult to do, so why don't we just continue with this farce of a, a, a system that we have in the first place that doesn't actually get at whether the candidate has permission, but it gives us this nice, warm, and fuzzy feeling that everything is okay. Well, it's not okay. It's a, it's a ridiculous system. It's a system that is easily abused. It, can be e it would be easily abused if we, if we did what what I'd like to do, which is get rid of this, this registration requirement. But at least it would take the government out of the you know, business of giving approval to people, which is not our business in the first place. So a couple other things, I guess. I'm not concerned about the city becoming blighted. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about I think I heard maybe like five examples, Dearborn, Bel Air, Michigan. I don't even know where Bel Air is. Ventura, California, mm -hmm. uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. I mean, I'm sure there are more, but you know, there are not a lot of cities that I drive through and think, wow, this is just absolutely terrible. And the cities that you would say, you know, there are some nearby, I think Clinton Township doesn't do a very good job. 
but that's because they just let it happen. So they, they must not care to enforce the ordinances that they have or the ordinances they have aren't very good. We have a pretty restrictive ordinance even if we don't have a registration requirement. So, you know, as Mrs. Zarco said, you know, with her example about Mr. Romano, she, she said, no, I can't let you put up a sign because I've already got enough, which is exactly what would happen with a commercial business owner. They'd say, sorry, I can't let you do it. I already have enough. Or if they don't know the ordinance, somebody knock on their door, go in and say, you got too many signs. If you don't take one of them down, we're going to take all of them down. It's a pretty simple thing. I mean, you're, the idea that if we get rid of the registration requirement, then code enforcement officers are going to drive by a corner that has umpteen million signs on it and say, I guess we can't do anything about that. That's patently untrue. You, the, the code enforcement officers will still have every tool available to them right now. They just won't have a list that mm -hmm. could be completely arbitrarily uh, produced in the first place to say which one, which one of those three or four or five signs have permission. So, you know, I, I, I just, I think that we're in search of a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And um, it's unfortunate because uh, I certainly don't think that this is, this is self-serving to get rid of this. I mean, for God's sake, you want to run against the mayor, you got to go give the city hall a permission slip from a property owner. I mean, what property owner would want to do that? It, it makes no sense. It's hard enough for a property owner to say, you know what, I'm going to support the challenger to the mayor, and I'm going to let you put a sign on my, my property. But now you're going to walk down to City Hall and give a permission slip to the city clerk that says, I, property owner, want to support the guy running against the mayor. That is a, I mean, we can, all, we can talk about whether that's a prior restraint, a constitutional prior restraint, but I know I sure as heck wouldn't do that. If I was a commercial property owner and I was operating in a city, I'm not going to city hall. You're, you're telling me you gotta, I gotta take a permission slip down to city hall to tell the mayor that I'm right. I know, and you're gonna say, it's not a permission slip, but <clears throat> good luck explaining that to somebody. So I, I think it's really, it's really not the fair thing to do for challenger candidates. It's not the fair way to treat uh, people who, um, would like to, you know, break into elected office, and and so I, I don't think I think what's self-serving is making um, challenger candidates file something with the city clerk's office saying that this property owner is supporting me and not an incumbent. That's I, I think that's uh, has a, a chilling effect on speech, and it's not the right thing to do. Um, we are not going to become blighted. We are going to continue to enforce the ordinance that we have as it's written. And if it makes it a little bit harder on our code enforcement, I don't even think it would make it any harder on our code enforcement officers. You'd say, you'd, you'd knock on the door. You'd say, one of those signs has to come down. If you don't do it, they're all coming down. Then they all come down if they don't. Mayor Taylor, so, can we call the question? Uh, yeah. I still want to speak, Mr. Mayor Taylor. Well, I will... Um, I will say that I'm going to let Mr. Radke speak again. If you guys call the question, I overrule the call the question. I think if you have a vote, there's a, what's the procedure, Mr. Uh, Kashubsky? There would be a vote on calling the question. Okay, we'll have a vote to call the question. Uh, can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Um, Mrs. Riska? Has everyone spoken? Is this to call the question? This is to call, this is the, on the motion to call the question. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Zarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarowski? Yes. Mr. Taylor? No. Motion passes uh, five to two. Motion on the floor is to, uh, well, the motion on the floor has been moved and supported. With no further discussion, uh, Mrs. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote on the motion, on the main motion on the floor? Yes. Mrs. Zarko? No. Mrs. Kosky? No. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? No. Mrs. Sarasky? No. Mayor Taylor? Yes. And Mr. Yanez? No. 
Motion fails uh, five to two, or two to five, as it were, and uh, we live to fight another day. Another day. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Zarco. Uh, resolve to deny introduction of an ordinance amendment eliminating in part or in full registration requirements for temporary signage section 28.13L of zoning ordinance number 278. Second. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mrs. Zarco? No discussion. We've had enough. Mr. Mr. Taylor. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, to go back to the previous point, you know, um, the current system is self-serving. It serves the people sitting up here, not the people sitting out there. It's, it's about entrenched power. And when we have a, a population, I think one third of our city is born, foreign born. A lot of them are refugees. They come from places where government power isn't, isn't used so, so fair to them, but it's used to enforce the rules that are arbitrary and capricious and hurts people. And it's say to our property or the commercial property owners in the city, well, this is a different place. The government isn't going to pick on you. The government isn't going to isn't going to hurt you or use you. Or, I think that is a, a crazy thought, and I think it's offensive. But more than that, you know, when you're talking about political signs, and we're talking about all signs, but political signs specifically, you don't put up one political sign. You put up 50 or 100. So the idea you have to fill out a separate form for each of 100 signs. That's not a one-minute requirement or a two-minute requirement. That's a three-hour requirement. It's a four-hour requirement. And, it's, and to have to gather the information, to put the information into that thing, that's another several hours. So you're making it hard for people to put up signs. On top of that, um, you know, how does a property owner revoke their, their discretion for the signs? If the city doesn't even notify them that, that they've registered, I guess in the next, in the next uh, election, I'm just going to register for every property I feel like. The city can go around and start yanking signs, and then I can say, oh, well, because there's no penalty here. If you lie on this form, there's no penalty, as far as I know. Is there a penalty, Mr. McLeod, for the chair? Mr. McLeod. Uh, no, the sign gets pulled, other than the fact that you've certified that you've talked to that person and provided that person. So is, there a, is there a penalty? Do I get fined if I lie to you? No, at, at that point, with the temporary sign, it's simply pulled. Right. Once, once we ascertain that I'm lying. Correct. But until then, if someone else tries to put their sign on their property, if the property in a code enforcement officer is driving by with his magic chart of things, he'll just start pulling signs that could legally be there because I've abused the system that we've created for no reason. To the chair to Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Uh, correct. I mean, the, the, the premise is, is that hopefully political candidates are truthful and mm -hmm. honest and presenting information to the city that they're certifying and attesting to. Um, so if we do have a candidate that is doing something that is... Uh, not That's not illegal. <laughs> What's that? Not illegal. So it's it just doing what he's not supposed to do, I guess you could say. Well, I, I, from the standpoint of that the registration requirements mm -hmm. makes you certify that you've talked to the person, mm -hmm. you are breaking policy. You're breaking registration. I mean, so right. up to each candidate to make that determination on their own, I guess. And, you know, and then to, to your comments earlier, you know, how do other cities do it? You know, our, our, our esteemed council has said that there's five places that you can think of in the whole nation that do this. How do other cities do it? I, I just don't know. I think it's amazing. Now, how does Ann Arbor do it? How does Traverse City do it? How does any of the cities that surround us do it? Now, some cities don't enforce their ordinances. But cities that do, I don't think Ann Arbor is blighted. They don't have this registration requirement. How do they, how do they live in Ann Arbor? I don't know. I think it's crazy. And I think that this is all just a way for entrenched political power to keep themselves in power. Don't believe the people up here that they're protecting you from your speech. They're getting between you and the property owner. They're getting between you and the other people. That's all I have to say, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, anyone else, Council? Well, yeah, so to get back to where I was before, um, Mr. McLeod, if the registration requirement were eliminated and code enforcement saw a corner or a, of course, it wouldn't have been eliminated under the prior motion uh, for vacant property. So we're not talking about vacant property. So we're talking about owner, or we're talking about occupied non-residential or improved non-residential parcels. If code enforcement were to see without a registration requirement for those parcels, a property that had more signs or more square footage than was allowed under the under the ordinance 
Would code enforcement be powerless <coughs> to do anything about it? No, the ordinance enforcement process would follow. It's typical that they would go in, contact whoever they could in terms of either management company or manager of the property or property owner. Uh, so all the signs would be tagged in terms of being non-compliant. If the owner or management company didn't comply uh, and bring the signs into compliance, then code enforcement would simply go out and remove all the signs. So then would you agree with me that with proper enforcement, the city would never turn into a blighted condition like we saw on the signs, on the images that the administration prepared as part of this agenda item? Well, I think part of the, part of the issue would simply be if code enforcement officers were tasked with doing that for every single property, the, the task would be monumental. I mean, keeping in mind, again, these are part-time code enforcement officers. But, that's, but, but you're assuming that there's going to be just an absolute influx of signs, an uncontrollable flooding of signs if you get rid of the registration requirement. Is that, is that kind of what you're assuming there? We're assuming that there would obviously be a drastic increase in the number of signs, yes based on the amount of signs that we traditionally pull and based on, as even you noted, Mr. Mayor, our surrounding communities' actions. Okay, but surrounding communities, like I said, they might have more expansive sign ordinances. They might allow more than 40 square feet. Or they might just say, we are not going to emphasize code enforcement. During election cycles, this is just the way it's going to be. We don't know that. But what we do know is that we would enforce the sign ordinance. And the same reason that we don't have a sign or we don't have a permit um, requirement for residential properties is because we know you if you see if the code enforcement officer sees a flood of signs on somebody's front yard, they'd go knock on the door and tell them that some have to come down. And that's the same thing we're talking about with this ordinance that you have to think of a building that you're driving down the street. It's a commercial building and there's somebody that you can go in there and talk to. Even if it's just a secretary at the front desk, you can say, hey, you've got too many signs out there and we're going to take them down. They're going to get on the horn with the boss and find out you know, what should be done. And if they don't, the city's going to take the signs down. So the, the rationale for why we would not eliminate the permit requirement is because then it would throw us into disarray. Code enforcement would say, how do we enforce this? What do we do? How are we going to actually track down the person with the authority to tell us who has the, the authority to have a sign up? But what we're tacitly admitting is we don't really care about that on the front end. We don't care if you get a property manager, if you get a store manager, if you get just a clerk. All you got to do is come up with an email address for a person who kind of works at this place, put it in the form, and then that's, that's good enough for the city. But we're ignoring the actual reality here is that you don't go to your place of business and see a sign that you don't want there and just drive by it and say, well, I guess there's nothing I can do about that. You take it down. So there's not going to be any blight. The property owner should be deciding themselves without any interference from the government. It puts property owners in a very difficult position if they want to support somebody who is not an incumbent. And I see absolutely no good reason why we should be doing this, except for it makes it easier for a couple of people at City Hall. I, I, I just don't, I don't agree with that. I never have, I never will. And uh, it's unfortunate that we're just going to continue on this path that um, makes it makes it more difficult for people to engage in political speech for no good reason. Anyone else? All in favor, uh, well, I guess we'll have another roll call vote. Ms. Mayor Ms. Taylor, could we have Ms. Riska read the motion, um, please? The motion, do you, do you want to read the motion? The motion is to deny introduction of an ordinance amending an ordinance amendment eliminating in part or in full registration requirements for temporary signage section 28.13L of zoning ordinance number 278. Is that your understanding, Mrs. Zarko? So yes, so we're not in, we're, it's a status quo is the what I right. want it to be. So I think that's what it is. And I, I did vote it in favor. I thank you kindly for making that motion to allow us to speak on this again. Um, without any further discussion, Mrs. Riska, can we have a roll call vote? 
Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Roski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? No. Mr. Yanez? Yes. And Mrs. Zarko? Yes. Okay, motion uh, carries five to two, and we will move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is an ordinance adoption. This is to adopt an ordinance amending Article 5, Chapter 20 of the City Code to conform local regulations for fireworks to the State of Michigan's Fireworks Safety Act as amended. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? If not, Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolved to adopt the ordinance amending Article 5 of Chapter 20 of the City Code to conform local regulations for fireworks to the State of Michigan's Fireworks Safety Act as amended. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? I would say that we covered this pretty well last week. I, I look believe forward so. to tightening the rules up. Anyone else? No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is the consent agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item or in a, on any item in the consent agenda? If not, Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the consent agenda. Support. It's been moved and supported with. No discussion. no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is communications from citizens. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on any item not on tonight's agenda? I'll take you, Miss, in the back and thank you for your patience. It wasn't easy, I will admit. I had a long day. <laughs> uh, my name is Dawn Mandel. I'm a citizen of the city. And um, forgive me for having my phone here, but um, it's kind of keeping me on track. Myself and several neighbors have been having some issues with one particular neighbor for many years. Um, so I'm coming before you this evening to ask that you amend one of your current ordinances, which is related to um, code enforcement, um, general property maintenance, and um, the violation of the code. As it stands right now, um, Again, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared. I can't wait from work. If there are current violations and there are new violations on property maintenance, junk, code violations, they are considered new and separate issues. And I have a very big problem with that. And I'll explain why. Um, my neighbor directly across the street outside of my front window uh, has no respect for his neighborhood, his property. Um, code, the process, and it's been ongoing for many years. Um, myself and several, several of our neighbors um, contact your code enforcement department regularly. Uh, we know Horace by name. Um, and the problem that I have with keeping issues separate and new when they are already in violation is um, citizens such as this don't care, and they learn how to manipulate the process. Um, for example, um, we're, we're talking about junk, we're talking about landscaping blocks, we're talking about broken garage doors, vehicles that aren't um, in operating condition, that aren't registered, and of course there's a complaint, there's a visit by one of your, I was sorry to hear, part-time code enforcement in a city as prosperous as we are. Um, and then they give them the opportunity to improve, and then they don't, and then they give them some more time to improve, and then they're in front of the appeals board, and then they're given more time to comply and improve, and then they don't, and then we're asking for warrants to abate their property, which is more time, and we're talking about a manipulation of the system that goes on for many months and years. Um, we deserve better. The process as it stands is punitive to citizens that do take care of their property, that do care about their communities and their neighbors and their neighborhoods. And I would like to see that change. Um, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And if you don't mind uh, providing us, you, if you provide the clerk with the address, either your address or the address that's in violation, Okay. They'll make sure it gets to us and, and that we can monitor and, it. And one other thing, if I may. Um, the reason that I decided to come here this evening is because 
in one of our conver one of our many conversations with the code enforcement office um, and one of our complaints about the process literally starting over and over and over and over again um, one of your clerks said oh I could tell you horror stories that's just the way the ordinance is well you're the people that can change it and I'm asking you to do so um, it's unreasonable it's ridiculous and we're really tired of that that process thank you okay thank you very much anyone else under communications from citizens mrs. early good evening again mayor city council members and audience I'm here I'm Jasmine early and I'm here as a legal immigrant and an American citizen. I'm here to request on behalf of the Sterling Heights residents to let our state legislators in Lansing know that we support House Bill 4083 and 4090 called Local Law Enforcement Protection Act. I find it timely that we hire today three more police officers so we can help them. If you read the house bills, the language states that is to prohibit from enacting or enforcing any law that will limit local officials or employees from communicating or cooperating with appropriate federal officials concerning the immigration status of individuals and it continues. As Americans, we know these policies are for our community's best interest. They foster a safe environment. They show the support for our legislators, mayor, council members, to our local law enforcement. We are all aware of the risk that it is to become a sanctuary city. And we want to prevent crime. Let's follow the old saying, it is better to be safe than sorry. I also want to bring to the attention of the residents, because we are talking about immigration and how immigrants are treated in, treated in the city. The fact that we cannot allow elected officials to denigrate the image of residents just because those residents do not agree with your personal agenda. These residents, including me, believe in marriage between a man and a woman, support freedom of religion, and are 100% pro-life. Also, these residents are educated in the threat that Sharia law poses to our country. It is shameful that some of you call me a bigot and all of the name calling you desire. We don't hate anybody. Whatever their ideology is, they should be respected, so do we. The hate that I have received come from the leftists living um, in our city, and I can show the post in Facebook. The no, camera's gone. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just learned that. Oh, how oh. sad that Mr. Radke called me a bigot, that Mayor Taylor, I can show the proof that he said that I, um, residents said that because I am brown and they can't understand a word that I said, um, they don't support me, but I am willing to align with them, which they are good people, Mayor Taylor. You also said that my anti-freedom view, views um, for immigrants and other sins, which is a lie, because I do not hate anybody. Um, the only thing, good thing that I see for the comments that you made in public, in Facebook, in the Sterling Heights local page, is that people are finding out who you are. And they have come to me in the last few days after I cry, seeing how you mistreat an immigrant all right, that's like all. me, Thank that you, is Early. sad. And you should apologize publicly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Early. Anyone else under communications from citizens? Mr. Jefferson. Um, 
Charles Jefferson Sterling Heights. Um, you guys worried about that signed ordinance. I wish you guys were worried about the signature ordinance because that thing is out, it's out of control. Um, we can have way more candidates or better selection than what we do have if we lower that signature requirement. There's no need for the mayor of Detroit, the largest city in the state, to only have 500 signatures. And here in the city of Sterling Heights, we have to get double. It, it, it double the start, but then you got to get extra just to make sure. That that's that's craziness, um, Mr. Rowski, You being our nurse person, have you considered uh, bringing up a motion or an ordinance to pass against the uh, electronic cigarettes, the vape cigarettes, uh, an age limit here in Sterling Heights, so that the younger kids don't get hooked on the nicotine to smoke. It, it's got to start off someplace, might as well start off here in the city. Um, at the last meeting, Mr. Vanderpool tried to play me as I was like some chump or something, but he know good and well I was talking about the educational program that we have with the CBG, uh, the single parent program, the slash displaced homemaker program where we can get people educated here in Sterling Heights, at least a two-year degree at Macomb Community College. I'm looking to have that change to the low-income educational program so we can include more people. I know Mayor Taylor is working on this on his end to try to get us to a, all our students to be so they can all have a four-year education. I know he's not doing that. I'm just throwing that out there. We all know that. <laughs> he ain't doing it. And last but not least, Mayor Taylor, yes, I agree with Ms. Early. People are looking at you uh, slant eye because of all the cussing, putting people down, uh, just not being appropriate at all times. Like tonight, you did Mr. Uh, Kaszewski that way tonight. So. You people, it's time. I keep saying this. Please, 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 this year, please go to the Sterling Heights Chamber and ask them. We do want a meet the candidates night, not meet the candidates morning. They got plenty of time to come up with a date with that thing so we can uh, ask questions. I know they like to ask softball questions. Then they like to get questions from the rat. But... Um, we can ask questions to pull you to the side, and if you can't answer those questions, then we can make a, a choice on other individuals. And uh, people stay tuned for late November, early December with that sign ordinance. It will come back. I'm positive. I, I, I've been down here years, and I bet you I didn't waste 10, 15 hours just on that sign ordinance sitting through these meetings. It makes no sense that this thing keeps coming up time and time and time and time and time again. That lady back there asked uh, for ordinance. It won't get changed, lady. I'm telling you, that's the only ordinance that gets changed is or discussed up here is that sign ordinance at any length. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Anyone else under communications from citizens? If not, I'll close that portion and go on to reports from city administration. Mr. Vanderpool? Nothing further, Mayor. Mr. Kaszubski? Nothing tonight, Mayor. Council, any uh, reports? New Mr. business? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yannis? Yeah, I would just like to respond to uh, Mr. Jefferson <clears throat> in regards to e-cigarettes. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, when I was in state legislature, I had a package of bills that would tax e-cigarettes like tobacco. They are not right now. Um, you should know that uh, there is a federal age requirement of the age of 18. So if you try to buy online, uh, like anything else, that they would ask you your age. Uh, but the state of Michigan is the only state in the United States. All other 49 states have uh, an age law. Michigan is still the last state that doesn't have an age law. Well, that means kids coming home from junior high school or middle school uh, can stop at a, at a party store and buy e-cigarettes or, or hookah tobacco if, if the owner would was willing to sell it. I think that's shameful. I think that hurts our kids. 
I think that hurts society. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances that we know of. And I think the state of Michigan needs to do something. When I had my bills, I couldn't even get a hearing, not even a vote, a hearing here in the state of Michigan. So um, I just want everybody to know that. Um, that this is, I think this is a stain on our state and it's an affront to our children uh, that we do not protect them from uh, uh, the addiction of nicotine. And uh, so I just wanna uh, say that and I have nothing further, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Yanez. Anyone else Mr. on council? Mayor? Mr. Radke. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Kaszubski. Can the city impose a, an age requirement on e-cigarettes if the state hasn't? I know that Ann Arbor raised the age <clears throat> of tobacco purchases at 21. So I'm wondering, can the city impose it even if the state does not? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sorry. Yeah, yes, we can, and I thought we did. I'm looking for the ordinance okay. now. I believe we've made it so anyone under the age of 18 I thought we had, but I thought can't purchase any you know, type of e-cigarette from any uh, any retail outlet in the city. Do you, and I guess if you could find this information for me, would you be willing to tell me what's the fine? Is it just a $500 fine or something like that? I'll look it up and I'll Please. get it for you. Thank you, sir. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Radke, Council, anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. And just briefly, Mr. Jefferson had some very good points today. Um, we are not, it's not an ordinance that, our, that is our signature requirement. It's in the city charter. In order to change that, we have to have first a vote here, then present it to the people and have that voted on. Um, th that whole package, in addition to the terms of the council, have been brought to the voters multiple times. It's just, it's never been voted up, approved to change. So that's why right now it is what it is. It's a percentage of the registered voters in the city that uh, determine the number of required signatures. So that has been the way the city has run since the beginning of it being a city. Yes, it's, it's cumbersome. It's not, it's not easy for incumbents. It's even harder for people trying to run against the incumbents and just run for office. It's, it's a very cumbersome requirement of our charter. So I would love to see it changed, but I don't expect it's going to be done soon. That's all I have. I think it should be done soon. I don't think it's gone in front of the voters, and I think we need to put it in front of the voters, and um, I think we should do that sooner rather than later. Um, there, there is no reason for it to be a, a 1,000 or 855 whatever uh, signature requirement. It should be something much more reasonable. Anyone else, council? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Been moved and supported. With no discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>